A quorum being present, this town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I guess we've lost the flag, but... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, ready? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we begin, I have one very quick announcement. Uh, the Drama Club of Reading is presenting Sleepy... It should be working. Can you hear me now? Okay. Quick announcement. The Drama Club asked me to announce that they are presenting Sleepy Hollow this weekend, in case you hadn't guessed. Um, they, it, the performances are May 1st and 2nd at 7 p.m. and then on Sunday at 2 p.m. Tickets are $15 for adults and $10 for students and seniors. At this point, Mr. Doxer moves that we take Article 2 from the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Moderator, my presentation may take slightly more than 10 minutes. I ask permission to speak to that. Is there any objection? Sorry? My presentation may take uh, a little bit longer than 10 minutes. I'm asking permission to speak for 15, please. Is there any objection? Not appearing, Mr. Doxer. Thank you. Let's, can everyone hear me now? How's that? OK, thank you. Fellow town meeting members, members of town boards and committees, fellow Reading residents, thank you for the opportunity to provide this update to town meeting tonight. Here's a quick overview of what I'd like to discuss this evening. The last few years have been marked by very strong leadership in Reading Town government and the school system. We're the envy of many other communities who often seek out our solutions as a model for their own. Conservative budgeting practices have worked very well for us, and we've benefited from revenues ahead of forecast and cost increases at or below budgeted levels. So really, responsible management has led to the return of unexpended funds in very meaningful amounts in each of the last few years. We've had very substantial regeneration of funds, and that complemented with our conservative budgeting has led to real growth in our cash reserves to nearly 10% at the end of fiscal 14, and they'll probably be in the 8% or so range at the end of fiscal 15. This has allowed town meeting to fund the town and schools with budgets offering in most cases close to level services. However, the situation will tighten in fiscal 16 and 17 and beyond. We anticipate budgets that will not allow for the same type of level services starting in fiscal 17. We will continue to recommend the use of modest amounts of our reserves to help balance the budgets to avoid sharp cuts and layoffs. But we're at a decision point for services that we want and are willing to pay for. Accommodated costs, things like health care inflation, which we have very little influence over, represent almost 38% of the budget and are increasing at a 5 plus percent rate per year, while revenues have only been increasing at 25 to 3%. This is going to create a gap starting in fiscal 17. And that gap is going to require us to look at a variety of cost reducing and revenue enhancing options. After 11 years since the last Prop 25 override approved by Reading voters, this and other options all need to be on the table. For the past few years, our growth and regeneration has been stronger than forecast, which is great. That said, we're very reliant on property taxes for our revenues. This reliance has increased from 64% in 2003 to 72% in fiscal 16. This has happened as state aid has decreased as a percentage of our needs and a percentage of our revenues. Local revenues have been stronger than forecast, with automobile excise taxes at record high levels. These would appear to be post-recession trends that are likely to moderate in the coming years. And while they help a lot, they're not enough to move the needle by themselves. The town had the foresight to vote in a meals tax in 2010 that has produced new revenues and higher than had been initially thought. The many wonderful restaurants in town have been experiencing good business from Reading residents, as well as enticing customers from beyond our town borders, creating a source of revenue beyond property taxes. This year 15 included very substantial accomplishments, as Dr. Ensminger, Ensminger excuse me, mentioned on Monday night. 
we were able to leverage $5 million in state funds to support our library building project. Town meeting earlier this year approved the purchase of modular classrooms to support the kindergarten population and space needs. And we once again funded $475,000 to the OPEP, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits Account. This is a liability on the town that we are, are trying to fund through these activities each year. Though FinCom has not yet created a formal policy on OPEP, this will be our fourth year in a row of making substantial contributions to it. As budgets tighten in coming years, it'll become more challenging to continue this level of contribution. Uh, last but not least on here, our policies, the strong financial management policies and operations, along with a very strong cash position, that 10% I mentioned, led Standard & Poor's to rate us a AAA, the highest rating that they offer, saving us significant debt service costs in achieving an interest rate of below 1.5% for the library and other town projects. So how have we been able to do this? The town has used very conservative management and creative forward thinking to achieve many efficiencies in how our services are offered. Our ability to achieve close to level funding budgets has been a result of many one-time or limited time opportunities that are less likely to be replicated in the coming years. We continue to recommend and to use about one and a half and up to $1.7 million in free cash each year to supplement a fairly conservative budget. As I mentioned, we've achieved both stronger revenue growth and substantially higher funds regeneration in the last several years, resulting in our cash reserve position actually improving. These cannot be counted on going forward. They are most certainly, they are quite welcome. Relatively modest increases in health care costs in the last few years were below budget. This is likely going to change going forward. For this year, we were given an increase of only 8.2%. We anticipate that this or a higher number are likely in the future. The town was also awarded some substantial multi-year federal grant money through the schools and through our CASA. Extracurricular activity fees have been increased, and for fiscal 16, school reserve accounts have been reduced to achieve our budget. This year, FinCom started looking at a two-year planning horizon for operating budgets to allow the town and schools to project and budget their expenditures over a longer window, allowing for improved uh, transparency for the community. This approach necessitated making some assumptions for both the rate of health care cost inflation and state aid growth, neither of which are known at the start of the budget process. In fact, state aid isn't completely known even yet. This is the first year of this approach, and we actually did pretty well. We were very close with our estimate for the rate of increase in health care, and a little bit short on our estimate of state aid, which we assumed would be 2.5%. FinCom has sponsored a series of financial forums over the last several years, seeking and discussing ideas on how to find new sources of revenue, as well as how to manage our costs of delivering services and improve efficiency. Many of these ideas have been proposed and or implemented, resulting in many improvements. We plan to continue these forums and welcome input from one and all. For fiscal 16, it's once again the case that FinCom has recommended the use of $1.5 million of free cash to supplement our operating budget and allow for this year's close to level service budget. This level of free cash use, along with our other proposals, excuse me, with the other proposals in front of town meeting, some that we talked about on Monday night, um, and, and some others including paying for the extraordinary expenditure this year for snow and ice removal, will draw down our cash reserves, but will still leave us well above FinCom's current 5% reserve policy and probably more in the 8% sort of range. To be clear, FinCom is evaluating the sufficiency of 5% in reserves and we'll report to back to town meeting in the fall with our thinking. Having a strong reserve buffer has served us very well in case of unexpected needs, like the snow and ice, and has allowed us to keep our debt service costs very low. With accommodated costs, like the health care inflation we talked about, that is now up to 38% of the budget. You can see the growth for, from 2015, it was just over 36%. It's forecast to grow up to more than 38% of the budget. Uh, that ends up having an impact of about 5% or more per year on the total budget in terms of costs going up. Our revenue growth only goes up 2.5% to 3%, 2.5% to prop 2.5% and, and then some new growth. That means the operating budgets are getting squeezed. We're doing great things with our tax dollars, but it's also important and instructive to look at what we are not doing. Both the schools and the town prepared a list of unfunded activities that are in their presentations inside the warrant so that you can see some of the items that are not currently being funded. Even with the continued use of modest amounts of free cash, 
The town manager and the superintendent have stated that they do not feel they can maintain the current level of services for fiscal 17 without a significant new revenue source. We believe it's prudent for the town to review both the priorities as well as various options that should be considered in deciding about cuts versus additional revenues. On Monday night, you heard the chairs of both the selectmen and the school committee commit to working together to address these issues. Cost controls through efficiencies have been employed well by the town and additional opportunities need to be identified. Services and spending need to be reviewed to determine where reductions and eliminations can be made. Revenue sources can range from long-term solutions like economic development to seeking out additional limited time opportunities. We can lobby for additional state aid, but the realities of the MBTA situation may, may limit the opportunity for this. We can also explore some other state funding mechanisms like the Community Preservation Act to understand what it could do to help us. As I shared very briefly in the overview, and as both the chair of the selectmen and the chair of the school committee discussed on Monday night, there needs to be consideration and discussion about an override of Prop 2 and a half. The quick poll results from Monday evening showed that two-thirds of town meeting believe that a Prop 2 and a half override will be needed and that it should be on the April ballot in either 2016, I believe 38 percent said that, or 2017, 28 percent said that. Reading residents last approved an operating override more than 10 years ago in 2003. Prop 2 and a half by design forces local governments to do the right thing to make choices in the service levels they provide, to cut when revenue is insufficient, and to choose to override when the desired level of services can no longer be maintained. I did a little bit of research to see what's been happening around the Commonwealth, and I found that since the year 2000, 62% of the cities and towns of the, of the Commonwealth have brought forward 1,447 overrides to voters, with just over 50% of them passing. In the last four and a quarter years, since 2010, 30% of the cities and towns have brought 274 overrides to the voters, again with about 50% passing. They've ranged from the smallest one I could find, which is $85,000 in Chilmark for participation in an estuary project, to $8.4 million in Newton to support municipal and schools, which passed in 2013. This obviously is a very important discussion and decision to be taken by the town. Reading really is a community that's powered by a spirit of cooperation and volunteerism. We've been rated one of the most desirable places to live in Massachusetts and the entire USA. We're very fortunate to have boards and committees that can and do work together. We also have many diverse groups in town with needs and desires for services and different abilities to pay for these services. We encourage all constituencies in the town to make their needs and desires heard by town officials and by our fellow townspeople who will need to vote to support these changes. FinCom really is town meetings representative in this process. We view our role as to work very closely with elected and appointed bodies of the town and with the residents. And what we'll be doing is to help determine the fiscal prudence and level of funding proposals for a potential operating override, ideas for cost cutting and improved efficiencies, and for other new potential sources of revenue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dux. Are you also giving the uh, procurement investigation? It feels like I was just up here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. I've been seeking direction. Uh, last fall, town meeting voted to have FinCom use its investigative powers to review the purchasing and specifically disposal policies of RMLD and town departments. This investigation was sparked by the revelation of some RMLD vehicles that were sold at a very low cost and were the subject of an anonymous letter to the town accountant questioning the practice. 
The RMLD rescinded the transactions and the vehicles were returned to the RMLD. In addition, the Reading Municipal Light Board took action to change the policies in question last summer. Further investigations by the town accountant also found that there had been at least one example of asset disposal in town departments that merited further investigation into our policies and procedures. Uh, an independent CPA firm, Powers & Sullivan of Wakefield, was hired by FinCom to lead these investigations. Early this year, the firm completed its review of the circumstances surrounding the RMLD disposal of excess vehicles last summer. Powers & Sullivan found that the policy in effect at the time of the discovery of the vehicle sales was poorly written and led to procedures that were far from best practices. Their report concluded that the new policy set in place by the Reading Municipal Light Board has addressed most of the issues and offers the opportunity for best practices. They, however, suggest that training be performed in order to create appropriate procedures. This is now taking place. They did not find anything that led them to suggest, sorry, this is Powers and Sullivan, did not find anything that led them to suggest any further action relating to the disposal of these vehicles was required. FinCom views this part of the investigation to be complete. Powers and Sullivan's findings were presented to and approved by the entire FinCom by a vote of 900 on March 18th of 2015. Powers and Sullivan is now working on a phase two, which will involve all town, schools, and the RMLD to explore procurement and specifically disposal procedures to review and evaluate current practices. A survey was recently circulated to all town, school, and RMLD departments to understand where disposal occurs and how it's handled. Powers and Sullivan will analyze the resulting information, and based on these findings, FinCom will meet to discuss if any further investigation is warranted. FinCom will then provide an update on this phase for an upcoming, upcoming town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, library building project, uh, Mr. Hutchinson. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I uh, also want to thank Town Meeting and the Town for its continued patience and uh, wisdom and foresight to support the library project. Um, so I just want to give you a brief update. A little more details uh, have been touched on already uh, in the, uh, on Monday and tonight. Um, but this has been a project that's been about seven or eight years in the making. So this is it's really the fun part. We've got a fantastic design, we're executing, and we're quite close. And it's, gen it's all good news, so let's start with that. Um, so uh, just a few milestones that uh, we've achieved, uh, and some of these were mentioned before, but we put out the final bid uh, documents. We selected a, a general contractor, and they've been working um, since November, and. I suppose December is when we really dug into it. Um, they're doing great, and we're right on track. Um, and we did have a uh, neighbors and community meeting, um, and the project manager has been working closely with uh, neighbors, taking questions. We've had a meeting, and we have another meeting coming up in May to make sure that they understand the project and what's happening. Um, we had a groundbreaking ceremony in February, um, and in November, the library moved out of its uh, the building that's being renovated into 80 General Way, um, which went quite smoothly, and uh, hopefully most of you have been to the temporary location, but uh, things are great there, um, and all the services are happening. Um, so there we are cutting the ribbon to make it official, um, and people and patrons going in. Um, so I encourage you to go over there. It has the same warm feel uh, as the old library, just not the same facility. I'm gonna flip through the pictures quickly, but I'm sure this will be posted. So opening day, we had uh, some patrons and folks that were interested in checking out some books in the new place, so it's, it's going quite well. Um, more pictures, there's a picture of the staff, happy. That's probably before opening, but now I'm sure they're doing okay. We had a lot of help during the groundbreaking. We had uh, obviously some community members. Uh, this is Greg Stepler's daughter, I believe. Um, and then we had our elected officials who stopped by to, uh, to take part and uh, shout out to them for helping us get the state funding, the five million that was referenced. Um, they dislodged that from the state uh, funding and that came to us. So they were very happy to see the project proceed. 
And they had some nice words for us, and there we are breaking ground. So just a, a short recap of some of the things that have happened in the last few months in the facility. Um, all the hazardous materials have been removed, um, and the demolition, interior demolition, is nearly complete. Uh, all the windows have been removed. Uh, the interior structural framing has started, and the site prep for the new addition has begun. Uh, it was a bit difficult, if you recall, we, we broke ground in February, and that's when we had all the blizzards and the, the uh, nine feet of snow. So one of the first things you need to do when the site is put up a perimeter fencing to make sure that uh, there's no erosion or debris or something. So that was, that was a challenge in itself, but they got it done, and I don't think it affected our timing too much. Um, it has been mentioned before, the project is within budget uh, on schedule. We expect to be substantially complete in the spring of 2016. If that does pan out, then we should be able to take occupancy in summer 2016, um, which is really not that far away. Um, just a note on the budget, um, as was mentioned, the 18.4 million total project of which the state is giving us 5.1. We have receipt of 3 million of the 5 million already, so we're still, I think we're still spending the state's money, but we're probably crossing the line very quickly. And as has been noted, Bob was able to secure some really favorable financing for the balance. So we have all the money. As far as the project spend, um, no surprises. The, uh, the construction bid came in at or below our budget. The, uh, the architects and other professional services are on fixed fee. There may be occasional design changes, but um, we also have all the reserves still um, sitting there that we had planned, plus a little extra that came from the slightly favorable construction results. So, fingers crossed, most of the design uncertainty is now out of the project. There's obviously still some execution uncertainty as they uh, dig and kick around and there's some design choices, but we, we should, I'm confident that we'll certainly stay within the 18. We'll have to see how we do and if we can get some back. There's a few final things we're looking at that haven't been priced out. But, um, we do post weekly updates if you're interested on this at the library website. So if you ever want to see what's going on, the project manager uh, produces uh, weekly updates so you can just jump on and see what's going on. Um, and now I just have some pictures of things that uh, that have occurred in the last few months. This is the site prep, of course, and the perimeter, perimeter fencing that I was saying. Demolish the inside. There's a, a backhoe, but you can see the windows coming out. Um, some exterior work. There's the basement excavation. As far as I know, nothing untoward has been discovered, bodies or treasure, so. Um, so far, so good. But they got the smell out, I believe, which was disturbing people. So there's one of the turrets exposed. Um, and this is the addition. This is on the, uh, this is where that modest addition will go on the side. So they're clearing some of the land. Um, and as I mentioned, the library is operating in full uh, at, the other, at the other site, same hours, uh, same friendly staff and helpful staff. Um, so I do encourage you to go. The children's room is still accommodating children at the library, and they're maintaining all the programs, of course, um, so that the kids are still happy getting what they need from the library. And the staff has really been aggressive about maintaining its outreach activities, including uh, doing them in other locations because the facility can't support what it used to. Um, so they've been working with the schools and uh, the other uh, the police department to really uh, use the space of town, and it's been very, a very nice process um, in services to the community. We have author's visits, robotics workshop. So things are still happening, is the point. There's, there's been no real disruption. We're still singing, and we will have another community meeting um, on May 20th, so if anyone has interest in the project. I do want to thank Ruth Urell, the library director, for putting the presentation together and providing all these nice pictures of the project. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, zoning project update, Mr. Hansen.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good evening, town meeting members, members of our various town committees and boards and, uh, and guests. Uh, my name is Jeff Hansen, Precinct 7, but for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Community Planning and Development Commission as its current chairman. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to provide this update to town meeting. So the purpose of this speech is twofold. <clears throat> First, uh, to provide a brief recap of our recently approved and implemented zoning bylaw changes. And then two, more importantly, to provide awareness and an update on the work the CPD, CPDC is taking on in 2015 and beyond to round out the rewriting of our zoning bylaw. So let's uh, first take a look at the work that we've completed so far. And you can see it in the slide behind me, kind of the, your, be your left, the leftmost uh, three columns. Uh, we started our work around the summertime of 2013, which culminated in our November 2013 uh, town meeting, where we brought forth and it was passed uh, the moratorium on medical marijuana uh, treatment centers. We deleted uh, off-premise signs and we updated dimensional controls for the Dover Amendment uses. So that really started the momentum, that got the ball rolling for this project that we've been working on. Uh, shortly thereafter, a consultant was hired, the Zoning Advisory Committee was assembled, and uh, we went to work. So the ZAC led the efforts that were presented to you in September and November of 2014. In September, we were able to pass uh, four different changes. Uh, the first one was we were able to um, implement special requirements for medical marijuana treatment centers. So that put an end to the moratorium and put actual regulations in place. Uh, two, we, were upda uh, we updated the establishment of districts, section three. And then the second two, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the third and fourth, we were actually uh, able to delete uh, two districts, the Wetlands Protection District and the Mixed Use Overlay District. If you recall, the purpose section was also included in that town meeting, but that was voted down. Uh, more to come on that in a few minutes. And then in November 2014, I'm sure you all remember that, um, we reorganized the entire bylaw, we updated the administration section, we updated uh, the use regulations, notably accessory apartments, landscape bylaw, and then new requirements for um, accessory structures and uses. We updated the non-conforming section, and then lastly, we updated uh, the applicability and severability uh, section of the bylaw. So all of the November 2014 changes were approved by the Attorney General on May 9th, 2015. Um, so that's a pretty recent approval that the Attorney General provided. Uh, so the, re I'm sorry, March 9th, excuse me. Thank you. That would be very recent, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that correction, my apologies. Uh, so March 9th, 2015. Uh, so the, the revised zoning bylaw has been in use for a very short period of time. It's been about six weeks, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but with that said, the CPDC does realize that a lot of information was reviewed by town meeting in November, and it was packed into a short period of time. So um, I'm gonna make a commitment to you tonight um, that we will formally track, discuss, and debate, we being the CPDC, uh, any feedback received regarding the bylaw changes. Uh, the ZAC and the CPDC do feel that they did review uh, multiple angles for the proposed changes. However, CPDC does um, anticipate that there may be some necessary cleanup that we need to bring before you uh, as we get further into the use of, the, of our zoning bylaw. So as we use it more, we're gonna learn more about um, a lot of the changes as they apply to real life. Uh, furthermore, zoning is an ongoing conversation. It's never done, we will always be adjusting. Uh, it's the conversation that we have with town meeting and with our citizens that's critical to keep our bylaw current and in line with our goals as a town. So uh, in short, please provide us your input and feedback. Uh, now to the more important portion of uh, my speech, the topics um, that we're currently working through in preparation for the November 2015 town meeting. So our scope for November has changed somewhat based on what has been communicated in the past. Originally, we wanted to accomplish everything we didn't accomplish in November this year. And uh, for many reasons, we felt it best to scale this back. Uh, one was, one, the obvious reason, we heard your feedback. Uh, do not have a repeat of November 2014. There was too much information. Town meeting wants smaller chunks so it can get into the necessary details. Uh, so you'll see in a few minutes that our proposed scope for November 2015 is much more manageable. And then the second reason we had to scale back our scope is timeline. The town manager um, very, very wisely put together a very strict set of milestones for uh, the inclusion of topics in the town meeting warrant for November. So we simply could not accomplish all of these topics within the confines of that, of that timeline. 
So with those considerations in mind, CPDC had to decide what it could take on and what it should, what it should push forward with for November. Uh, so we decided to push forward with those in uh, November 15 and then beyond will happen obviously after that. Uh, and we selected the beyond column or those to push out into beyond for a few specific reasons. The PRD and the PUD, these are large sections of the bylaw and we've, we've realized quickly that they really do need to be reviewed together. Um, and then initial discussion within the CPDC realized or, or revealed uh, quite a wide ranging uh, amount of opinions and uh, levels of opinion. So we need the time to do the proper due diligence for those two sections. Uh, the second piece that we're pushing out, parking, uh, lots of public input obviously is gonna be required for that and we need time allocated for that discussion as well. And then signs, obviously that's probably the most popular section of our bylaw um, and it will absolutely require an extensive amount of public input. Um, and not to mention, well, I guess more importantly, um, we were encouraged by our town council that we should really push this out because there's currently a court, uh, court case in front of the US Supreme Court that could change how the zoning bylaw as it pertains to science could be drafted. So until that case is resolved, we felt it best not to spend time on that. So what are we, what are we actually gonna take on for November? Um, we have three primary areas that we're targeting for November town meeting, uh, excuse me, November 2015 town meeting warrant. First, the purpose, section 1.0. Again, if you recall, this section was voted down in September 2014. We have revisited the purpose and included feedback from the Zoning Advisory Committee and the town, and town meeting to consider Lexington, the town of Lexington's purpose. Uh, so we've incorporated that very simple purpose statement to kind of be the preamble to the purpose itself. And then we will maintain the existing bullets that are currently in the purpose section. Um, we heard feedback through town meeting that those purpose bullets are, uh, they're significant, they align to what our goals are. So we felt that it was best to keep them in there. And then too, we also did a little bit of, of mapping, if you will, and we were able to map all of those bullets back to the master plan. So they're significant and they're relevant and we felt it best to keep that in there. The next section that we are taking on for November 2015 is the uh, section 10.3 Aquifer Protection District. Uh, without a doubt, this is the section of the bylaw that the CPDC and the ZAC received probably its most feedback on uh, through the public hearings and through other channels. The first thing we did with this section of the bylaw is we reached out to the Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, to identify how we could change our bylaw in light of the feedback we were receiving from town meeting and from our citizens. Um, and we realized that our bylaw was actually stricter than what the DEP requires. So as a result, we've, re we've revised our regulations to be less strict. We've uh, addressed your feedback, but we were, will still remain in compliance with DEP regulations. So what do the changes include for that section of the bylaw? We're removing residential districts from requiring artificial recharge systems. Um, so rather, uh, residential units can accomplish recharge using low impact technologies such as rain, gardens, and swales. And we've also clarified the permitting requirements for lots within the, dis within the district. The last section that we're taking on for November 2015 is section 5.6.3, the commercial communication structures. Town Council strongly encouraged the CPDC to revise this part of the bylaw at our earliest opportunity. Um, simply put, our current bylaw does not comply with the Federal Communica Telecommunications Act. Uh, so our new bylaw, obviously, it will comply. Um, it will also provide greater clarity regarding location, screening, setbacks, height, and application procedures. Uh, currently, we have a draft, and the CPDC is now um, in the process of having discussions and making some decisions on key elements of this part of the bylaw. Um, those elements that we're looking at are who's gonna issue the special permit. Is it gonna be the CPDC, or is it gonna be the Zoning Board of Appeals? And then more importantly, what are the town's preferences, quote unquote preferences, as to where we want these structures to be located? So that's something that, uh, that we're working through right now um, and we will, more to come on that. So next steps. So as of today, the CPDC has completed drafting the revised purpose and aquifer protection district sections and town council has also reviewed both of them. Uh, the Aquifer Protection District uh, will be sent to the DEP for one last review. 
Uh, we, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have some work to do in the commercial communication structures section. We'll be taking that on in our next meeting, which I believe is two weeks from today. Um, and then more importantly, for your awareness, um, CPDC is tentatively scheduling um, to hold our public hearings on these bylaw revisions on June 8th and June 29th. So you're encouraged to attend those meetings and provide your input. You can request drafts of these revised bylaws by contacting the planning department. Uh, additionally, the planning department is currently in the process of transitioning uh, the zoning rewrite website that was on the consultant's um, webpage to the Reading Towns website, and that'll happen within the next few weeks. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, a key element of that transition is to ensure that information is well organized and well maintained. Again, we realized there were some challenges with uh, the work that was done last year. So we want to keep that uh, in mind as we make that transition. So following these public hearings, the CPDC will begin digging into the topics that have been pushed out beyond November 2015, what's in the beyond column to, uh, behind me. Uh, again, a critical piece to that body of work is public input and awareness. Uh, so we in intend to spend a good deal of our time planning on how we can ensure that we can gather your feedback. In conclusion, and on behalf of the CPDC, I'd like to, town thank meeting, uh, like to thank town meeting for your interest, input, and participation in the rewriting of the Reading Zoning Bylaw. I can assure you it is a better document, thanks in large part to your involvement. And as I mentioned, please continue to provide your input to town planning staff. The CPDC will discuss this input in upcoming meetings. And lastly, please attend our public hearings. And thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Now, do we have a, uh, a report on the firearms instruction, instructional motion? Mr. Sexton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, town meeting members, Vice Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, John Halsey, was originally supposed to um, provide this report to you, but we were also supposed to do this on Monday night. Um, he's not here this evening. He apologizes. He asked me to give you the report in his absence. Uh, this is in regards to the instructional motion of uh, Section 8.9.1, the Firearms Bylaw. It was an instructional motion put forth at January special town meeting by Mary Ellen O'Neill. Um, behind me is the actual uh, motion that was put forward. Uh, so it's to move the town uh, meeting, ask the town manager and the board of selectmen to do the following. Look into how and why general bylaw 8.9.1 was amended in 2011 and report back to annual town meeting. Uh, this was done as part of a recodification of the general bylaws in 2011. It was led by former town council Gary Brackett whose firm is formally closed. Mr. Brackett and his records are not available. He was joined in this process by Peter Heckenbleckner and Laura uh, Gemme. Laura has no direct recollection of this particular action, but the only available notes indicate this was part of a general language cleanup performed by town council in that section. This was designed to bring the Reading Code into compliance with Mass General Law. The next section was to investigate the history of the Timonex Swamp and how it was designated conservation land with an island of private land in the middle of it and report back to town meeting, annual town meeting. This research is still in progress. Chuck Tyrone, our conservation administrator, will be, um, will be reporting his findings as part of a larger report to the Board of Selectmen this coming uh, Tuesday, May 5th. Uh, John Halsey research indicates a private ownership of the island property in question dating back to the 1920s. There was brief periods of town ownership due to tax delinquencies, which were always cleared up, restoring private ownership. The next section was uh, determine and implement strategies that will, in the immediate future, improve safety of nearby residents and travelers through the neighborhood of Timnex Swamp by, for example, clearly and visibly delineating the boundaries of this conservation land, posting no hunting signs on all parcels of town land, etc. Um, this map, uh, this map shows where exactly those are determined to be. 
Um, again, John Halsey attended two Conservation Commission meetings with discussions on the no hunting postings for the conservation area of Tinamac Swamp, which was voted and approved by Conservation Commission. He spoke and corresponded directly with the trustee of the privately held property surrounded by the conservation area in question, John Peeker of Wakefield. Mr. Peeker graciously, graciously agreed to revoke all previous hunting permissions and allow the town of Reading to post his property with no hunting signs. Subsequently, the Conservation Commission voted to also post this private land in accordance with the owner's request. The Conservation Commission, with volunteer help, has done research for signage and will be attending the May 5th Board of Selectmen meeting to secure funding for the project. The weather and terrain conditions now allow posting of the signage. These actions seem to be a speedy, reasonable, and immediate solution to any public safety concerns that may have arisen relative to hunting on private property in the Tinmanek Swamp area that is immediately adjacent to rightfully concerned neighbors. The next section was to investigate the legality of transporting any type of firearm or explosives across town land for the purpose of hunting, sporting, etc., and report back to annual town meeting. Upon his research, Chief Cormier provided the following information regarding this point. That's the last one, yeah. Yeah. Um, the indication is that a lawfully licensed person may carry a firearm in an appropriate manner anywhere in Reading, except as specifically provided by state law. For example, it is illegal to possess a firearm on school property except by a police officer in the performance of his duty. With the understanding this is not a definitive report, this subject will be further explored by our committee with the help and direction of Deputy Chief Mark Segalia, a member of the ad hoc committee. The last point was to appoint a working group to draft a revision to general bylaw 8.9.1 that protects the rights and interests of all town citizens. Behind me is that policy uh, as it was uh, drawn up. Uh, review the highlights of this composition of the committee as noted on the policy statement as well as the direction of meetings and deadlines for reports back to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, both the town manager and town council will be involved in this process along with myself, John Halsey, Deputy Chief Mark Segalia, plus four citizens. Currently we have seven applications of those four citizens to serve and we are, the Volunteer uh, Appointment Subcommittee is going to be interviewing all seven candidates this Tuesday, May 5th, starting at 6.15 at Town Hall, if anyone would like to attend. Uh, and we'll, the uh, Volunteer Appointment Subcommittee will be um, nominating four people, uh, four citizens to the board later that evening uh, for the recommendation onto the committee. All set. Dr. Ensminger moves that we lay the uh, substance of Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Article 2 is laid on the, laid on the table. Dr. Ensminger moves that we lay the substance of Article 3 on the table. Is there a second? Second. Uh, just as a um, uh, point of um, explanation for our newcomers, we generally handle instructional motions at the end of the last night. The microphone is not working. Any better? Is that any better? Okay. Just as an explanation to the uh, to uh, new town meeting members, we generally take up instructional motions at the end of the last night. That's why we we put it on the table now. So we have a motion to lay it on the table. Uh, there's we have a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and Article Three is laid on the table. We have already handled Article Four, so we will move to Article Five. Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, town meeting members. There was an additional handout today. There was a correction last Monday. There was a correction today as of 4 o'clock, which I'll get to shortly. Can you hear me okay? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> um, pages 6 to 8 of the uh, warrant report um, describe this article. Uh, things highlighted in red that are behind me are not in your warrant report itself, but should have been included in the various handouts. Let me start at the top and I'll go quickly. Um, unfortunately, in the last fiscal year, three of our firefighters had um, such severe injuries that they had to retire. After speaking with the town accountant a year ago, 
and discussing the possibility that this might happen, um, we felt that a different line and a different budget should handle these expenses. Uh, as an example, in the fire department, when one firefighter is injured and already approved for retirement, but not, not yet through the process, which can easily take six months, uh, overtime is uh, filling that officer's uh, uh, spot. So if you will, the same hour is costing the department two and a half times. One and a half times in overtime and one time for the firefighter that's not yet retired. Um, if it weren't for the retirement process that 111F requires, the firefighter would be retired and being paid by the retirement side of the house. So it seemed that it was a good solution to move uh, wages spent on firefighters that have already been approved to be retired, but they haven't yet retired, into the benefit section. Uh, this gives you the long-term look at how, what it really costs to run a fire department, because those employees are not active members, if you will, of the department. So in this case, again, unfortunately, we had three. Um, this is, uh, they were various times during the year and various lengths for a total cost of over, over 150,000. In the, the rest of the uh, benefits line, we did have some savings, uh, almost 50,000 in retirement and almost 200,000 in health insurance premiums. In capital, um, you saw some uh, changes in the capital plan. Much of that went towards the special town meeting. Two smaller items went to this current uh, operating budget, uh, a, a public works uh, Chevy Blazer and a firefighter uh, safety equipment. We had uh, about $75,000 of interest rate savings from uh, debt service, which was nice. And then something that was not in the warrant book, uh, but was handed out Monday, in the administrative services department, we had a delay to hiring, uh, mostly because of the charter committee's work as defining a role. And that person now starts on Monday, and we, we can't wait. But we have $75,000 unspent, so that's available for this budget. Uh, the late breaking news at 4 o'clock today, on the one hand, I was sad to open the bills. On the other hand, I was thrilled I didn't open them tomorrow. Um, as town meeting may recall, in one of the several special town meetings, I think it was September, we asked for a, a budget transfer for legal because um, the school department had to start paying TLT litigation for the high school out of the operating budget and not out of a construction fund. Um, I, I will be very careful because this is a subject of executive session and ongoing litigation. I'm very limited in what I can say. But what I can say after speaking to the superintendent late this afternoon is I have upped the increase, uh, rather I've increased the estimate by another $100,000 of what we're going to go through in legal fees between now and June. That probably is a little higher than it needs to be, but I have no flexibility in this budget in case I'm wrong. I have to ask for this money now. Um, I'll get back to that on the next slide. Um, we also spent $20,000 mailing out the charter. We didn't want to. That was state law. I sure, I'm sure everyone read it. We sent out uh, 8,500 charters to the different households in town. I saw recycling was up that week. Uh, and lastly, some technology for police. I wanted to describe the legal budget just in a little more detail. Um, you can see that amount in red. Um, that's special counsel that the school committee has hired uh, specifically for TLT litigation. So it's, it's, again, probably a high figure, but it's over $200,000 for this year. And I show you this because I want to assure town meeting that the legal bu uh, bills are very high this year. But if you go to the far right, that's what's budgeted for FY16. And if you go one column before that, that's what I believe the run rate is this year, except for one-time things. Um, and by one-time things, I mean such as the charter review. There will be some zoning expenses next year, but uh, not as much as this year. And then um, you know, the, the TLT litigation is meant to wrap up in June with a last piece due uh, late in the fall. So I just wanted to assure uh, town meeting that the run rate is very high this year. There's a tremendous amount of one-time costs, and he's worth it. Those of you that have been in town meeting uh, before have seen this. When we hire new police officers, uh, they actually have to pay the uh, tuition costs uh, to go to the academy. Um, and it's, it's a technicality, but we have them pay the general fund, and we pay the tuition ourselves. Uh, there's a, a vacation retirement sick 
uh, buyback in public works. There's a couple of small expense items in public works, more than offset by fuel savings this year. Um, the snow and ice, uh, you know, was difficult this year. Um, I had mentioned the FinCom when we had the $900,000 number. There was one good storm left in there, and I'm glad to say it didn't happen. Um, and then a very sharp-eyed town meeting member a couple of days ago noticed that we had transposed two digits or two words. So the reason they're in red is it's different than your warrant report. This is the accurate one. K94 is street lights. K95 is rubbish. The numbers haven't changed. The last item, um, I'm really happy the library is doing a long-range plan. Um, they hope to have the results for November town meeting. They're trying to set themselves up to move into the, to the beautiful new building they'll have. Lastly, in the town facilities department, uh, they need $50,000 in a natural gas uh, extra cost. They've taken care of that for next year. If you look at the budget, it's, it's up quite a bit. Um, that's something that really could have been adjusted a couple of years ago. Uh, the long and short of all these changes is we need $700,000 of free cash, which considering the winter is not so bad, we are asking you to vote $140,000 out of the inspections revolving fund to help pay for this. And uh, again, we're going to use a, that small amount for sick buy, buyback stabilization funds. Fincom report, Mr. Lidecker. At the, at the Fincom committee meetings held on April 30th and March 25th, the Finance Committee voted 7-0 and 8-0, respectively, to recommend the article was presented. Is there further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Um, why is there a decrease in the shade tree program? I'm sorry, Marilyn, could you ask that again? The shade tree, the $2,000. Is that a decrease? No, that's an increase. That's, that's an we increase. want to plant some more shade trees. We are going to plant some more. Okay. Yeah. So what does that bring in the total budget to for this year? I think 5,000. I think there was three in there before, so two or three. three. So, so five. Five, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. We generally do not uh, have people make motions anymore because you have them printed. And uh, because we were getting into the uh, routine of interrupting the speaker after about three words, and it just seemed a little silly. So last year we decided we would dispense with that as long as you had the motion in front of you. Further discussion? None appearing. This requires a two-thirds vote. I will take a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Vision is under Article 6. Ms. Angstrom? Can everybody hear me? Okay. <laughs> this article is to move $150,000 that was received from the state in 40R payments and move it from free cash and into a smart growth stabilization fund, which we've done in the past. The smart growth stabilization fund is typically used to fund additional road and sidewalk work, um, but there are no planned uses within fiscal 16 because there's already significant construction projects planned. FinCom report, Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of March 25th, FinCom voted 800 to recommend this article. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill? Ms. O'Neill? Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Have any money from this uh, fund been expended yet? has been, but not in the recent year. It's been a couple of years, I think. It's been a couple of years. Fiscal 13 or 14, I think we did use money from there, but not this year, and we're not planning in fiscal 16 to be using it. Well, I'm a little disappointed because I see that there was some, uh, there was a request for sidewalk improvements uh, in the DPW budget that wasn't funded. That is about a quarter of, or a little more uh, than what we- I think the issue's more time. I think that we, 
the time to get the work done it's not that we don't have this money set aside for it i think it's that they've got other things that they're getting done so i think that that's i mean they requested money for things that they don't actually have time to do this coming no, year no i'm saying that they're not going to request money for sidewalk work if they don't have the time to do it for you yet so that's what i'm saying yeah. if they've got other projects planned i'm assuming that's what they're saying is i they can't take on an additional project at this point i'm, I'm sorry uh, i don't quite understand because my understanding is that there was a request for additional money for sidewalks, and that was not approved. And I'm thinking that if there's some money that we, this is specifically what we want to put, not just the roadway. I know we have some, a lot of things going on with the roads, but we have some clear sidewalk issues in town, ones that are directly coming out of the depot that are used for a lot of walkers that would, you know, need to be addressed in the, whatever money we have in the capital, you know, goes just a very short way to addressing any of those. So. Um, I don't see why we can't put a small amount of this money uh, toward those, towards the sidewalks for this year. Mr. LeLasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Marilyn, the problem isn't the cash to do the project, even if we outsource it. We don't have the staff. Uh, if you drive around town, you'll see the engineers are flat out with number of projects, uh, both water, sewer, and paving. So it would really require hiring more staff at this point in order to take on more work. That's well, why for a year or two until West Street's done, we'll probably take it easy on things like this. All right, thanks. Further discussion? Yes. Hi, Mary Ann Downing, Precinct 3. So I'm um, new to what we're getting with smart growth payments. Are we expecting any more from Reading Woods? Is this a yearly thing? Mr. Lasher? Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think there's at least one more payment of 150,000, maybe two. There's, what are they, 3,000 a unit? So I think there's maybe two more due. Not a lot. I mean, but I, more, I, more projects may come along that qualify. Okay, so you get, you get like an upfront payment, and then you get a per unit payment. So I don't know, we've probably had a million, more than a million dollars so far. Because one of the things I recall when this growth was approved, this um, Reading Woods project was approved in the town, you know, they were selling it on the, the various payments like this that we would get for the town, and we could use it for other things. So I know it's not much, but as Ms. O'Neill said, there's a, there are some projects in town, I know, you said you, your staff is flat out, but we're, you know, this, this project is sending new kids to the school district for which we have to use free cash to pay for the modulars. I guess I just, and other things, I guess I just don't know why we don't leave it in free cash and use it for some of these expenses. Or it, is there really a lot of um, sidewalk improvement that, and stuff that we have to save it for? Mr. Lasher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. One alternative could have been to use some of this funds and less free cash, if you will, no, no real difference. Um, but you can't put this kind of money into an operating budget. You have to spend it on capital, for instance. There's a couple of other things. Um, but you shouldn't be spending this on you know, hiring another teacher for the school district because this money would run out. I don't mean that, but I mean, I'm, I'm just using that as an example. We have things in this warrant that, you know, we just had, we just approved something that's gonna come out of free cash. And it just seems like this, this meeting started with the, talk about all the fiscal challenges we have, so it seems like having more free cash is a good thing. I just don't know, but having it sit there in a fund to be used someday, it just seems like there's some one-time things that we need it for now, and the modulars are a one-time thing, which was just one example. Thank you. Um, I would agree with you if we knew the funding coming in was stopped, then we'd say, all right, what's the final spending plan, but it's still coming in. So, in, you know, it's at least two more 150s coming in. If, if that's the last project that's done under 40R, um, then we can rightly say, okay, we have this much money, let's spend it. Um, you know, you're right. We could have spent 500,000 um, on something else and not used 500,000 free cash, but we're gonna use it eventually. There's no magic. You mean we're gonna use it eventually on sidewalks and things? Well, this, this 500,000 will be used according to however town meeting chooses to vote it in the future you know, on whatever it will be. So it, it's very much like free cash. It's sitting in an account, so is free cash. So if we had the engineers, for example, it could be used to fix 
the other part of South Street that was dug up to put in gas lines for this project. It still hasn't been patched yet, right? Uh, I as certainly an wouldn't answer a specific request like that. No, I know. I'm just saying, for example. General. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? We'll try a hand count. This requires a two-thirds vote. We will try a hand count. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 7, Ms. Angstman. This article is to move the OPEB contributions approved as part of the Fiscal 15 budget into the OPEB Irrevocable Trust. The total amount, oops, the total amount of this um, contribution is $551,000, um, and the breakout per fund is listed on the slide. It's worth mentioning, because I think I mentioned it last year, is um, for the general fund, the total um, amount of this contribution when combined to benefit payments only represents about 69% of the annual required contribution to fully fund this liability within a 30-year period. So it will take in excess of 30 years for us to fully fund this OPEB liability for the general fund. However, the enterprise funds are fully funding their um, annual required contribution, and it will be fully funded within an 18-year period. FinCom report, Ms. Landry. At our meeting on March 25th, 2015, the Finance Committee voted 800 to recommend this article. Is there further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 8, Ms. Wilson. Can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Yep. Moderator, town meeting members. My name is Jesse Wilson, and I'm the community development director for the town, for those of you who don't know me. Article 8 relates to a recently adopted state program called Complete Streets. This new program allows MassDOT to create a certification process in which communities can apply to become a certified Complete Streets community. There are a number of criteria which need to be met to become a certified community, one of which is to have had adopted a Complete Streets policy, which we did back in July of 2014. Once eligible to be a certified community, Reading would be able to access funding under this legislation for Complete Streets projects. So what is a Complete Streets? It is a street that can accommodate all users, including drivers, bicyclists, and pedestrians. And the policy which we have adopted allows for proactive planning to ensure that a right-of-way is constructed or reconstructed to provide for safe travel for everyone in a manner that is specific to that particular situation. It is context system context sensitive and not prescriptive. So why do we adopt a complete streets policy? Well, our policy sets the standard for internal review of projects from routine maintenance projects to larger reconstruction projects to see if complete streets elements can be incorporated while we are in construction. By doing this, we're hopeful that we will not be miss any opportunities to incorporate these elements. Something as simple as a pavement project could prove to be an opportunity to paint bike lanes, or if the project is a much larger project, like a full roadway reconstruction, we should be considering things like sidewalks, signage, and other complete streets elements. The idea is that let's do it once and not miss the opportunity when the roadway is complete. Something to keep in mind is that our policy focuses on feasibility and context sensitivity. Many times, it is not feasible to incorporate complete streets to a routine maintenance project or reconstruction project, and our policy was designed to allow for those exemptions. It will, make, it will not make sense for every project to include a complete street, <coughs> but the goal of the policy is to ensure it was evaluated for potential improvements before it's too late. Another reason we adopted the policy is to have access to funding to implement cons complete streets projects. Sidewalks, curb outs, bump outs, et cetera, can be costly. In order to become certified community and to be eligible for this funding, we had to have adopted the Complete Streets policy. So I just want to show you a few examples of Complete Streets uh, elements that already exist in Reading. We have highly visible so crosswalks and curb extensions, bike parking, bike lanes, and good signage. 
So by voting yes on Article 8, we would be eligible to apply for and receive grants under the Complete Streets Program. Just want to note that we were ranked sixth in the nation for our policy by the N National Complete Streets Coalition, positioning us well for these future grants. Thank you. Income report. Ms. Perry. Income voted 8-0-0 at our March 25th meeting to support this article. Is there further discussion? Yes, on the, uh, on the edge. Dimitri Sekris, I'm in Precinct 4. I have a question. Um, does part of the Complete Streets funding include possibly incorporating different drainage options like rain gardens running along the sides of the streets, updating how we're dealing with stormwater runoff, that kind of thing? And garden islands. Thank you. The, uh, the program has not been finalized with MassDOT. They're working on creating the actual application process and how the funding will actually be distributed. So I'm not exactly sure whether or not that will be taken into consideration, but we will have to make sure that we're in compliance with our MS4 permit and stormwater requirements. Yes, Mr. Mon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Uh, first, in response to the previous question, we do have a stormwater enterprise fund. And that money is available for such things as rain gardens and stormwater improvement. So that's separate from this program, but that enterprise fund is, is fairly large right now. And we're looking for opportunities to improve our uh, water quality in Reading. So any, any suggestions would be accepted by the Public Works Department, I'm sure. And my questions on this motion, the policy has been in place since July of last year. Have any projects undergone review under this new policy? Ms. Wilson. It is very new. Um, however, we have taken a look at the FY16 resurfacing list and we'll be pro providing a memo to the Board of Selectmen on how the, those projects were evaluated for compliance with this policy. So the answer is no. No project has undergone, no project re has undergone review under this policy. Well, we have not implemented any directly as a result of this policy, but we do do regular improvements um, throughout the community. We have one project in particular, we'll be updating a pedestrian signal that is on Salem Street. It is a stationary pedestrian sign, no lighting associated with it. That will be actually updated to be a flashing signal for better visibility to allow pedestrians safer, safer passing. So the, summer, the West Street project did not undergo this review, correct? No, that was under MassDOT's review. Okay. And one final question. The picture you showed had a bike lane. I don't remember seeing a bike lane in Reading. Maybe I've been driving right with my eyes closed. That one is Haverhill Street. Is where? Haverhill Street. Oh, good. Thank you. Are there any others? Specifically like that, no. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. Tom Wise, Precinct 3. Um, Jesse, as I'm sure you're well aware, I've been through the ringer on these kind of things before. Um, so I'm wondering whether approving this or even approving the has any impact on residents trying to do work on their property and whether or not that's been thought of with regards to how this impacts them. Do they need to go through CPDC for further approvals like they do with St. Way? Is there anything like that that impacts the, the process of residents doing work in their space? This will apply to town-funded or state-funded roadway maintenance and reconstruction projects and privately funded roads, so new subdivisions that go in as well. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Barnes. Precinct 5. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just uh, related to that, um, and I apologize about my lack of information about the policy, but um, at the time, and I think this is a great idea, um, and I appreciate the effort and look forward to um, initiating some of these projects. I just want to ask, um, at the time there is discussion about any of these um, 
applications for uh, either funding or to go forward with any of these projects, whether it be the, uh, the, the visible crosswalks or the, the bike lanes or bike parking, to the extent that it may impact uh, residents or neighbors. Can you just elaborate a little bit on what the process will be at the time to include and incorporate um, public discussion about those ideas before they go into effect or before they're, they're applied for? Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, that'll all go through the road commissioners, which are these folks right here, the Board of Selectmen. So they would be holding, if not formal public hearings, at least informal ones. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Uh, Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Carpenter, Precinct 7. Uh, ambitious project, uh, but one of the reasons to bring these things to town meeting is maybe people will think of some of the unintended consequences. Anybody drive in Cambridge? Cambridge is the most bicycle-friendly town I know of. It has a number of these features physical features. Um, the problem is, if you only build the physical features, you, you invite a huge safety problem. I get cut off, every time I drive in Cambridge, I get cut off by bicyclists. It must be accompanied, there must be part of this program, an aggressive rules of the road education program for bicyclists, and aggressive enforcement so that you don't have bicyclists endangering their own lives and the lives of pedestrians, motorists, and so on, and other bicyclists by their uh, disregard of the rules of the road. What would it take to add a safety education program to this initiative? Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, before any project would get to the road commissioners, there's an internal group with an acronym I can't remember. It's very long. It's a lot of T's in it. Um, there's usually three out of seven members of the police department there. They're, they have your back. This is a big concern of them. Um, there's a lot of interesting planning ideas, but public safety has a huge influence on how we move forward. Follow up. Would we need to enact any uh, 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 any bylaw amendments to, to, for governance of, of, of how these bicycle ways are used? I, I would suppose if you did something really radically different in Reading, um, there'd be a lot of public discussion about it, and there probably would be a spin-off of what other rules and regulations do we need. But that's in the future. It's hard to speculate right now. Uh, but you know, given that it'll go through the board, you can be sure there'll be a lot of public discussion about whatever needs to change. Thank you. Further discussion? And appearing, we're ready for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 9. Mr. Berman, or are you uh, indefinitely postponing? Or? Okay, Mr. Berman moves that we indefinitely postpone the substance of Article 9. Is there a second? Second? Mr. Lalasha? We, uh, a motion is just, I'm sorry, I don't know what the problem is here. Um, Mr. Berman has just moved that we indefinitely postpone the substance of Article 9. Do we have an explanation? Mr. Lalasha? Uh, no roads are ready. Okay. Um, this is something that I've had to recuse myself since I own a house on a, on a private road, so I know very little about this. Um, but a meeting was held in the Board of Selectmen a few months back, and all the private road um, owners were invited in, so I went into my office. Um, a number of uh, private road owners did show up. George Zamboro, our town accountant, led the meeting, along with the selectmen, and developed a plan where four streets were close to being in acceptable state, and there was a whole range of other um, situations. Uh, none of the four turned out to be ready for this town meeting for a variety of four different reasons. They'll be brought back in November. But there will be over the next several meetings, not quite as horrific as zoning. There'll be a bunch of uh, private roads brought to you, and it's a big public process that goes through the selectmen 
um, there's, there's effectively, if you will, to be real simple, two types of private roads. Um, one, much to the surprise of some of the folks that live there, they think it's public, it was private, and that's because a subdivision developer walked away and did not complete the paperwork and oftentimes led, left some sort of a deposit or bond with the town. Um, most circumstances are people who are quite aware that it's a private road, and many of them will choose to leave it as a private road, because in order to bring it up to the condition, I, I can speak for, uh, in my area, I live near County Road, um, the dirt road or County Road is very narrow. Uh, those property owners do not want to, want to widen it and have sidewalks or curbing or any of that because it would chop down virtually every tree in the neighborhood. So there's a whole wide a variety of types of private roads and circumstances, but you will see some uh, coming to you in November and then afterwards. Any further discussion? Yes, to Coco. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Richard Coco, Precinct 4. The reason for my, my rising to ask a question, the, Redding, the, the town of Wakefield just recently went to an automated system for dump removal where the uh, operator of the truck picks up the trash container and dumps it. If that isn't implemented in Reading, who pays for those containers and how are they funded? Uh, might want to wait for the next that's, article I think you, for that one. Yeah. We're on Article 9. Next article. Okay, I'll wait. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Any further discussion on Article 9? Okay, the motion before us, did I miss one? No, the motion before us is to indefinitely postpone. All those in favor of postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed, and the motion carries. Business on Article 10, Mr. Zager. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jeff Zeg. I'm the Public Works Director. Uh, the article before you uh, is basically requesting, the purpose of the article is to get into a contract greater than three years uh, for rubbish collection and recycling collection. Um, we've done this in the past. Uh, we're coming to the end of a current contract. That actually expires June 30th of 16, so we've got a little bit of time uh, to negotiate a new contract uh, we have been approached by the current vendor, uh, and he is, they are currently preparing both a potential five-year and 10-year uh, contract extension proposal. We haven't received it officially yet, but we're getting that soon. But in order to even have that discussion, anything above and beyond the three-year period, we need town meeting approval to do that. Um, the uh, rubbish uh, recycling collection program is uh, not specifically uh, fall under the uh, RFP or bidding requirement, although it certainly can be. Uh, that's something, once we do receive a uh, proposal for the extension, uh, I will uh, sit down with, uh, with the town manager and the selectman will review that proposal uh, with a potential option of doing a formal RFP if uh, we feel that's in the best interest of the town and uh, depending on the specific proposal that we receive from the contractor. Um, the, uh, we will be looking at, uh, actually we are currently looking at other communities that have more recently entered into uh, five and there are a few 10-year contracts. Uh, the market right now is such that uh, we're in a good position to do that if we, want, if we chose to, uh, to go that direction. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the current program that we have, as I think everybody uh, realized when we changed it uh, in 2012 to uh, the mandatory recycling enforcement uh, component as well as the other pieces of the new contract included uh, the leaf collection five times a year as well as the, a lot of the recycling pieces that we now enjoy. Uh, when we did that, uh, we had a tremendous effect on the recycling program in the town. We went from approximately 17% recycling up to where we are now at 30%. And in fact, in 2012, the town did receive a Municipal Recycler of the Year Award uh, for uh, that type of uh, uh, progress that we made in the recycling area. So we have an excellent program in place. And I want to thank uh, uh, town meeting members as well as the residents that when we implemented it back in uh, 2012, uh, we had a few bumps on the road, especially when we started looking at the mandatory recycling component. But we got over that, uh, and the town really stepped out, uh, stepped up to the plate when, they, when we did that. So 
again, uh, the purpose of the article is just to let, give us the uh, ability to enter into a contract discussions over three years. We have a FinCom report. Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of March 25th, FinCom voted 800 to recommend this article. Mr. Coco, you have a, did you have a comment? I think I know the question. <laughs> Richard Coco, Precinct 4. Again, I'll ask the same question. Who pays for those special containers? The con well, eventually, I'm sure the town will somehow or another. The, exactly and, um, right. How will that cost be amateurized? Exactly right. The, the town, if, uh, in fact, the last time uh, we did look at, uh, we went out for, uh, for bid uh, RFP, and we did uh, get pricing on uh, the containers. And that would be the town would be responsible to pay for those. It would be worked into the contract. And at the time, uh, the containers uh, were in the area of $750,000, $800,000 for the each. Uh, no, total. For total. Okay. <laughs> we're not going to buy a dumpster, right? Right. But uh, so that would be, would be, the town would be responsible to pay that as part of the contract. Okay. So would, would residents then have to pay for the container? Uh, not necessarily. It would be, well, through the, through the uh, appropriation process, through the tax billing process, you would be, but not specifically a bill, no. But it would be in a, right, somehow tied into the writing yes. tax process. So yes. we, are, we are paying. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's, let's call it a bit. We are paying. Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's the important point. And there's also two different sizes I see in, in Wakefield. So Usually there's, there's two sizes. Usually they have a size for uh, the uh, recycling as well as a, a different size for the uh, actual trash uh, container. Uh, so that's probably why the difference is. Uh, they can vary. Uh, they'll usually a 64 gallon is usually the size for a trash and usually a little bit uh, smaller for the recycle. And again, we have weekly recycling here, so which, which is a plus. Uh, so your recycling wouldn't build up. So the container could be smaller for the recycling, but usually that's why they have two different sizes. I see. Okay. Thanks very much. Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, Precinct 2. I think it's worthy to point out that you might end up paying for the container. The alternative is you end up paying for more employees on the truck to pick the trash up. The bottom line is you're paying to have your trash picked up. Thank you. Yes. Further discussion? Mr. D'Addario? Uh, Ron D'Addario, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, first, I want to say I think our trash program is really great. Uh, and what, what I would just like to add is when we're looking at the different bids, that we don't lose the uh, leaf pickup that we got, and we don't lose uh, the Christmas tree pickup, and uh, the different benefits. Even, they even do an iron pickup, I think, at the door. So all of those benefits, I, I, would, I would rather pay a little more and, and keep that kind of thing going on. Uh, the other thing is, I think we're doing really great with recycling. And I was wondering, um, you know, when I walk <clears throat> around Reading and I, I'm doing it on trash day and I can see some of the red boxes, and I'm wondering, uh, we could even do better, even though I think we're probably pretty high statewide, and I'm sure we're over the average. But I'm wondering, what are you doing so that, you know, every piece of paper, gets into that box and you know how are we what can we do to um, educate our citizens on how important it is to even make our recycling even better than it is thank you further discussion mr. Berman thank you mr. moderator Barry Berman precinct 4 um, Jeff, if the, if the industry is getting more competitive now and, and, and we're kind of call it like a buyer's market maybe as opposed to a seller's market, what's the advantage of going long term on a contract? I would think we want to do shorter term contracts because if it's getting more competitive, why lock us into something where we could maybe do better in a year rather than locking it up for five? So I mean I can understand the reason for maybe having the ability to do longer term contracts if the if the 
you know, market changes a little bit, but right now I would think we want to go short, not long. Mr. Zager? Uh, I, don't do, I, I agree with you. I think uh, usually, um, again, the majority of the contracts are a five-year period, but even in the contract we have now that expires June 30th, 16, um, we do have some language in there that, for example, uh, right now if we chose to pursue a uh, single stream recycling versus a dual stream we have now, we separate the paper and so forth, we could do that um, now. So I guess th the answer is I guess we can build in language. I would recommend building in language, I even a five-year deal, to be able to take advantage, potentially have some, flex have some flexibility down the road if technology changes or we want to look at a different component of our pro a program, we could do that, but I agree with you. Further discussion? Mr. Downing? Um, I, I know a little bit about this industry, and uh, you're right, there's been a lot of changes in the industry over the last 10 years, but what you'll find is there's a group of uh, companies that are relatively safe, they have a very low experience modification rates, and there's other ones that offer really low prices, have very high um, accident rates, and some of which have more than 50 mortalities in their, in their company in a year. I, it, it, it seems hard to believe that any one company could have 50 mortalities in a year, but it happens in this industry. It's one of the most dangerous industries. And I think one of the things we probably should focus on more is um, shorter term contracts, because there are changes and there are companies that bid very low and go out of business during the term of the contract. That's happened quite a bit lately. And the other part about having very low experience modification rates is that I find that our current contractor does three things that I find very unsafe for their own workers and also for pedestrians and children. And those include two-sided pickup, driving down streets like Forest Street, picking up trash on both sides, which causes drivers to drive around the car the truck as the truck weaves from one side to the other. The other one is trash trucking, which is illegal. It's an illegal way to ride on a vehicle. It also gives bad examples to children on how vehicles should be mounted and ridden on. They shouldn't be jumping on the back of the truck. Many, many companies do not allow that now. Many of the major um, companies that are unlikely to go out of business don't do that. The other one is supervised backing. Our contractor does not always do supervised backing, even on narrow residential streets. I think these are three things that should be included in any contract that are not allowed. Many of the companies have cut those trash trucking stands off of the back of the truck so they can't do it. I, I think this is more important, and I think if you find companies that have, if we just had companies that had the average or less experience modification rate, that would not, that would not dis, allow 50%, as you might think. It only disallows about 7%, because that 7% is often 12 to 14 times higher experience modification rate. Seven to 12 times more accidents for their own employees. And I just don't want those kind of companies bidding on our contracts, driving in our streets, uh, interfering with the, the, the flow of traffic by two-sided pickup, and potentially injuring pedestrians or children. Thank you. And I think staying low in, in, in three years, we'll be in a better position in three years to bid this again. It's not like it's very expensive to bid this work for us, and I'm not sure that the people that are offering you these great deals are going to be around in nine, eight, or seven years. Mr. Lalasha. Jeff, you're a lot taller than me. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I agree with Jack that there's a lot, there's a lot of non-financial issues to be considered in a package, absolutely reliability of service. But I really wanted to um, finish up and, a and address uh, Mr. Berman's comment. Um, regardless of whatever the shape of the market is right now, what the town wants most is flexibility. If the market tells us right now the best deal is to sign up one year or three year, uh, a really important consideration, just think Bill Belichick, is club option. If you're in control and you have an option to extend beyond three years, you don't have to, but you may want to. Uh, we can only do a three-year contract without town mission, uh, meetings permission on anything. And that's why we're specifically asking for, you know, and there'll be another article later tonight for the same thing. Let us give the full range of flexibility to us in our discussions and negotiations, and then you'll just have to rely on all of us to do the right thing. But we need the most tools. 
Mr. Bonazzoli. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James Bonazzoli, Precinct 6. Um, Jeff and team, last contract we did, excellent job. As, as Mr. D'Addario said, I think we're getting an awful lot for, for our dollar. Question, though, to a couple of the points made. When we were negotiating last time, we actually were looking at regionalization. And that, at that time, what we were considering was, because that would help offset the, that enormous expense of bringing in those automated barrels. Where are we in looking, I, I know the issues that we had, and some we don't want air here, but part of it was getting us in sync with the other communities who were interested in partnering with us on a regional contract. Can you speak to that at all? Because that would help you give flexibility to looking at more of the automation of the trucks and the expense of the barrels that were mentioned before. Mr. Zager. Uh, thanks, Mr. Moderator. I think uh, I know a couple of the communities, uh, for example, I know Wakefield, someone mentioned they recently uh, changed their program where they have a uh, automated uh, uh, trash collection. Um, and I think, I believe they have a, a, a manual recycling. Uh, part of the problem is a lot of the communities uh, are different in that they have uh, different uh, components of their program. So to get together with another community for the exact specific type of program and, and agree to that, those programs is difficult. Um, when we did our, we did our program um, last time, uh, the biggest, as you, as you know, the biggest component was the mandatory recycling, which we uh, went forward and enforced. Um, and uh, the interesting part about that right now is that there are about, I think we're up to six or seven communities that have adopted our exact program in terms of the leaf collection, in terms of the number of barrels, uh, in terms of our recycling program, mandatory enforcement, the whole thing. So, um, but in terms of the regional approach, we did do a regional approach on the uh, disposal. Uh, we met with Wakefield and Stoneham and we negotiated a deal with Covanta to dis for the disposal component and uh, at 60 62 something a ton, we're one of the lowest communities in the area for disposal. So we did do that in the disposal part, but uh, to be honest with you, the, uh, the uh, collection is much more difficult. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I have uh, two separate issues. One is I'm in favor of um, um, this um, motion in terms of giving you more flexibility with the time of the contract, but there's no outside limit on it. Um, and I would like to know how that would work. Not to, you know, um, something that not to exceed. It just seems kind of too open-ended. Not that I don't trust you. Mr. LaLasher. Town Council just reminded me. I said flexibility. Um, certainly town meeting can put an upper limit on it if it wishes. Um, what I've seen in the past and what you'll see later on, on another issue is 10 years with a 10-year renewal, so 20 years. You know, town meeting's free to put any number in there they wish. I'm not going to make that amendment. If anyone else feels that that's you know important enough to do, I, I don't want to be the only one and make a make a big deal about it. Um, I assume that we you know do probably a five plus a five five year option because we do want to have flexibility not only in terms of the amount of money, but I'm also concerned in terms of the, how we actually you know the content of the um, trash pickup and the recycling because I mean I love what we're doing, but I want us to do more. And I want us to look into doing a food pickup or somehow getting a compost food kind of combination. You know, as we know at the state level, they're not allowing any of the f food from restaurants and other institutions to be put into the trash. I'd like to see us do something for the many of us that can't do composting at home. So that's one of the things. And whatever else we could do if we have an annual review of what's working and where, how we can do better, it would be really appreciated. Thank you. Further discussion? He that hasn't spoken yet? No, Mr. Downing? Uh, you mentioned Covanta, and I had a separate question. Uh, less important, but uh, I understand Covanta recently eliminated its organic waste stream, um, which means that things like uh, 
dog poop bags, the biodegradable bags, they don't, they no longer take. And I understand that the only appropriate place to put those things is actually in the sewer. Um, uh, do we have any collection like that? Do we have any specific places where that type of material, uh, and where would we get rid of it if Covanta doesn't? So we don't do that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the aisle, yes. Uh, Demetra Tsekras, Precinct 4. Quick question, and I, it's just because I don't know. If you put it out for bid, do you have to, by law, take the lowest bidder? Or do you still maintain your flexibility? Mr. Lalasher. That depends on how clever your town council is. So I'm guessing <laughs> full flexibility. Yes, you, you structure okay. the contract to give yourselves as many options as possible. If you're not careful, then yes, you have to take the lowest bid. But if you make it contingent upon you know, lowest qualified bidder, then the way you qualify someone can be very difficult to meet those qualifications. Okay. Second thing, and it's just a point, and I'm sorry if I'm obnoxious, but don't put dog poop in the sewer. Okay. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 11, Mr. Lalasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, town meeting members, I, I hope you read the background uh, in, the, in the warrant report. But let me go over some of the salient points. Um, a couple of years ago, annual town meeting passed an animal, con animal control bylaw uh, change. At that point, the Attorney General issued a caution on a specific portion of that bylaw, uh, which is the appeal process. Um, in the meanwhile, the state was in a tremendous amount of flux in examining animal control as a topic and changing their own laws, if you will. Uh, when we had uh, secured Newtown Council almost a year ago, um, you know, they reviewed the bylaw, uh, discussed it extensively with the Attorney General's office, and uh, realized that there was sort of a two-step process needed. We could just wait, but the AG's office really wasn't pleased with the uh, bylaw as it's written. So we thought that a two-step process would be better. Um, and I'll show you some details shortly. This first step, which is the smallest step by far, is minor wording changes with a couple of points that I'll hit. The second step is going to re require, I'm going to guess at least two and maybe three uh, meetings with the selectmen in the community to discuss what substantive changes does the community wish, if any, and exactly a, a real clar clarification of what it is we've said. Um, and town council will, will be uh, quite valuable in, in certainly that discussion. The specific changes, good heavens, um, made in this bylaw, there's, you can see there's just about half a dozen. Uh, section 8811 um, uses proper citation of law. I'd, I'd describe this as a cleanup for the uh, appeals committee process. Um, very similar for 8812. It's, it's syncing it up with state law. <laughs> 8816 adds a definition of a keeper. Town Council believed that that was an important addition. We had not uh, had that notion in the past. And you'll note that that phrase keeper is, is added several times in different sections of the bylaw. In 88113, there's a revised definition of a nuisance dog. I know I have one. And in 88117, um, there was an addition of a, a definition for temporary confinement order, which is then also used in some sections below. So again, the highlight here, and I've, I've talked to a few of you in the intervening week or two um, with some you know, suggested amendments and, and some changes. This is not meant to be the final bylaw by any means. This is meant to tide us over to next November so that should anything come across in, uh, the Animal Control uh, Appeals Committee, we have a bylaw that the AG does not hate. Um, I fully expect a November town meeting, uh, assuming the public uh, discourse is finished by then, that we'll have a substantially revised uh, bylaw, and I do mean substantially revised.
Bylaw Committee Report, Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. The Bylaw Committee at their meeting of March 24th recommended this article by a vote of 4-0-0. Further discussion? Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just out of curiosity, for example, Section 8.8.1, Nuisance Dog, who makes that determination of what what constitutes a nuisance dog? Mr. Lasher? I'm sorry, Jamie. What section was that? 8.8.1. Th point 13. Thank you. So ultimately, it would be the uh, uh, Animal Control Appeals Committee. There's three members. And, and is that an appointed board by the selectmen? Yes. Thank you. Yes, in the, uh, yes. Jennifer Hillary, Precinct 7. I also have a question regarding the nuisance dog definition in 8.8.113. I'm particularly concerned with subsection I, which reads, a nuisance dog is one that, by excessive barking or other disturbance, is a source of annoyance to a sick person residing in the vicinity. That language seems antiquated to me, and I'm curious, um, perhaps town council or the bylaw committee chair could speak to the intent of that section and why we wouldn't have just the reasonable person standard. You just copied the state statute. And do you think uh, then a, an examination of that particular section would be more appropriate in the second round of revisions? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Yes, uh, Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? Thomas Day Ryan, Precinct 1. I don't know why we don't have the microphone halfway. <clears throat> yeah, we got an example here of what I consider how we get carried away with rules and regulations. I refer you to page 12, 8.8.1.34, the effective voice control. To be under effective voice control, so forth, the animal must be within the owner's or keeper's sight and the owner or keeper must be carrying a leash. And here's where we get ridiculous. The animal must refrain from illegal activity. <laughs> Would someone please define what the illegal activities are and tell me how the animal is supposed to know what they are and must refrain from them. Thank you. Further discussion. Further discussion? None appearing? Are we ready for the vote? Oh, where? I'm sorry, where? Oh, uh, Mr. Sasso? Denise Sayozo, Precinct oh. 2, 8.8.3.7. Um, animals are not allowed during school hours. We should point out that those last two comments are not um, things that are being changed in this round. 8.8.3.7 is not on this particular list. 8.8.3.7. Right, it is not, that is not one, that is not part of the proposed amendment. Okay. Okay. There's no delineation there. Just says they're not allowed during school. Is Mr. Question? Mr. Lalasher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is a good example of something we'd want you to come in and discuss with the selectmen over the next few months. Okay. It's technically out of the scope of this article, but certainly will be in play for November. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Sasso. Thank 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, just so, so I was going to ask that question regarding um, out of scope, in scope. Um, I'm not sure if these two will, will qualify based on that, but um, where we did add the words owners or owner of, depending on this thing, um, we've added, um, it looks like in, in the text we have a set of definitions, and then in the actual bylaw we continue on, like so take for example 8.8.1.16, which is running at large, and then at the end of that sentence it uh, says, un or under effective voice control, and then it basically includes the definition again. Um, you know, my concern from a bylaw perspective or any is that you don't want to be repeating your definitions in the, do in the context of the bylaw itself. Um, that's the reason why you have a definition section. Um, so this particular sentence, maybe it's a technicality, you have actually changed. Um, but my um, amendment for this one and one other one would be to remove that last section because, again, I wouldn't want to see you have a conflict if in the future or even in the near future does you decide to make a change to the definition. Um, and just um, to, there's also a, a, a similar situation in 8.8.3.4, the entire last sen sentence again is, uh, is a repetition or attempt at a repetition of the definition itself. So I don't know, Mr. Motter, if the, those would qualify for you, but I certainly would suggest, it, even though this is minor, we should get rid of these two. Uh, are these, we did make a change to each one of those, whether we put the owner or keeper. Is that what you're referring to? I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You've, yes. I, again, technically you made a change to that, but yes. again, I know it's a minor change, but my recommendation is delete those two entirely out of there because they're just a repetition of the definition and you really shouldn't. You're talking about deleting the, the proposed changes. I'm talking about deleting the, the whole sentence associated with the proposed changes. Oh, I, I couldn't allow that, no. It, it, I could see changing the, I could see eliminating the uh, changes that were proposed. But if they're, they're out of the scope if they're not changes that are being made at this particular town meeting. Am I, am I missing? Yes, oh, okay. Okay, I thought maybe I was okay. missing your numbers. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. I've made notes for November, though. Further discussion? Okay, up on the back, uh, Ms. Schneider. Gina Schneider, Precinct 9, uh, 5. <laughs> <laughs> section 8.8.9 was my question. Refers to section 1.8 in terms of enforcement. Now, I'm not sure if I understand this properly, but I think section 1.8 is kennel license? Or is that not what they're referring to of this? But the sections have been renumbered, so I'm not sure what um, enforcement under the paragraph enforcement it refers to in accordance with the provisions of section 1.8. But I thought 1.8 is kennel license. Mr. Meares? No. Section 1.8 refers to way back at the beginning of the bylaws. Oh, okay. It's not of this section, but of all the all bylaws. All the way back to the beginning. And, and that hasn't they, been renumbered. That's right. Okay, so. thank you. Okay, there were. Uh, was there another one in the back? Oh, okay. No, Mr. Barnes? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jonathan Barnes, no, Precinct 5. Like uh, Bob, in terms of uh, keeping those notes, and this is probably um, what perhaps pretty petty, but uh, maybe not as crazy as an illegal, uh, <coughs> illegal activity of a dog. But as I was reading through this section, um, and you brought to our attention section 8.8.1, which is the definition of uh, a nuisance dog, um, and to move to double I, um, a nuisance dog is one that by excessive barking, causing damage or other interference, a reasonable person would find such behavior disruptive to one's quiet and peaceful enjoyment, um, which, which I understood. But then when, I, when you look at 8.8.3.2, um, disturbing the peace, uh, which is in the section of 8.8.3, um, 8.8.3.2 describes uh, disturbing the peace as no 
uh, animal shall disturb the peace. Uh, noise is excessive if it is uninterrupted, barking, yelping, et cetera, et cetera, for a period of time exceeding 15 minutes. Reasonable people may disagree, but somebody might think that, uh, that a nuisance dog is one that barks for less than 15 minutes rather than 15 minutes. And I only raise that because under 8.8.7, um, which is the section 8.8.7.1, declaring a dog to be a nuisance, an animal that repeatedly violates 8.8.3, which gets it to 15 minute duration, um, may be declared a nuisance dog, which is different from that. <laughs> Just don't want there yeah. to be any confusion when it gets applied. Mr. Mayaris? Okay, I think we can all agree there's a lot of problems with the animal bylaw. What we tried to do this round is just to address the, the cautions that the Attorney General has given uh, in the last couple of um, uh, rounds of amendment, just to address things that, that the Attorney General pointed out as being a caution. But we fix all those things by doing the things that, that um, are proposed here, that's great, uh, but it, as you can see, it's very easy to take pot shots at, at the bylaw the way it is. And that's why it needs a comprehensive overhaul. And we decided to break that into two parts and do the easy stuff now and the hard stuff in November. Further discussion? Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Barry Berman, Precinct 4. In 8811 and 8812, which look like they're new, they're, they're added. Um, the Animal Control Appeals Committee, that's defined as sort of being the body that handles dog complaints. Um, who handles that now? How is that done now currently? Uh, Mr. Lasher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Outrider. Um, there is an Animal Control Appeals Committee now. Oh, okay. uh, thankfully, they haven't been called on very often to use so this, this bylaw. So this is basically... But they um, exist now. There are three members. There's different stipulations. One has to be a dog owner. So this just memorializes what we're already doing. Mr. Meares? Yes, with one exception. <coughs> the statute requires the town to designate a hearing authority. So we, and one of the cautions we got was, you created an Animal Control Appeals Committee and you never said it was the hearing authority. So that's what, why the definition has, uh, has been added. And on 8812, the animal control officer, which is appointed by the town manager, um, who's doing that now? Or, or do we have someone now? Or, or if not, is it a police officer? Is it how? Mr. Lolasher? Excuse me. Uh, there's a civilian in the police department that does that now. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing? Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 12, Mr. L yes? Personal privilege, okay. Could you come up to the microphone? Thank you. Uh, Frank Driscoll, Precinct 3, uh, Marine Corps, 1966-1969. I would actually like to see a real flag on our stage instead of some picture of a flag. I think the uh, flag on the stage has a lot more meaning to the individuals than a picture. Point taken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, business under Article 12, Mr. Lalasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is a byproduct of the uh, Charter Review Committee that concluded its work in January, as I'm sure you remember. Um, the wording in the uh, draft warrant was specifically drafted to be very wide and very broad so that uh, town meeting and, and the selectmen ahead of that could make amendments. The selectmen uh, at their meeting on April 14th did meet and uh, discuss this and had a few residents in. I have to say that uh, since town meeting in uh, January, Jonathan Barnes has been very helpful in this article. Um, the amendment is to strike the, all, all the language that was put in the warrant and replace it as follows, and I'll go over with it uh, a section at a time. 
First, all boards and committees appointed by the Board of Selectmen may have associate members. This was a little bit difficult from a logistics uh, thing to do. Um, since the charter has now been approved, other boards and committees can appoint boards and committees. They didn't used to, only the selectmen had that authority under the old charter. What uh, the moderator and has, has ruled and town council certainly agrees with, um, there was some desire to expand this to beyond the board of selectmen, to have associate members. But that's really outside the scope of this article. That is the one thing that is outside the scope of this article. And there was, there was no real way to have put it inside the scope since it wasn't legal under the old charter. So just to be clear, um, we're only talking about a board of selectmen appointed bodies for this town meeting. If a uh, town meeting wishes to come back and expand it to other elected or appointed boards, uh, sorry, elected boards, that's fine. Um, the next section, which got a lot of discussion at the selectmen's meeting, is the number of associate members on a board or committee shall not exceed two thirds of the number of the regular members. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Associate members shall serve for a one year term. Associate members shall be appointed by the Board of Selectmen as the regular members are. I thought it would be interesting to see what the distribution is of the various boards and committees that the Selectmen appoint. There is actually one that has 10 members and you can see all the way down to the most common is five members. So on the right hand side uh, is the amount of associate members that would be allowed the most. Um, there were some discussions that night and, and before and after um, why not have the same amount as a full membership? Why not have just one or two? Two thirds was, you know, I guess somewhat of a compromise. Um, so the proposal is two thirds, and you can see for the majority of boards and committees that have approximately five, that'll be three members. Two, three, or four will be the most common. Um, now, this is where it gets, uh, I guess, useful and, and quite interesting. If any regular member is absent from a meeting, disqualified from acting, or otherwise unable to deliberate, so those, those are three different reasons, but they all basically mean they can't vote. <clears throat> the chair of a board or committee may designate one or more associate members to deliberate and vote on any matter before the board or committee. So this is given voting power to associate members. That's a significant change. If more than one associate member is available to fill a temporary vacancy, the chair shall, and that's not optional, that shall, designate the associate member having the greatest tenure on the board or committee, provided, however, that any associate member so des designated shall be entitled to continue to participate. So what this is saying is, although the chair appoints the associate, the chair does not have discretion to pick any associate they may wish. And that was a pr an important point to come out of the selectmen's meeting in terms of perhaps the chair trying to stack a vote. It's prescribed exactly which associate members uh, would be appointed. That's all. Bylaw committee report, Mr. Crook. <coughs> Stephen Crook, chair of the bylaw committee. The bylaw committee and its meeting of March 24th voted 400 to recommend the article as it appears in the warrant. The bylaw committee did not, has not taken a vote on the wording of the motion as developed by the Board of Selectmen at their April 14th meeting and as being moved tonight. Mr. Lalasha? Oh, oh, sorry. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. Binder. Jack Downing from Precinct 7. Oh. I, uh, I actually on called on Ms. Binder first. I'll come back to you. Ms. Binder? And I'll, I'll get to you next, Jack. Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I'm generally happy with what has been done and the um, privileges that are being afforded to the associate members. I have a couple of questions or comments. The first one is um, in the third section, um, unable to deliberate on a particular matter that comes before the board of committee. The chair of such a board or committee may designate one or more associate members. Um, I can see a scenario where it might actually be the 
chairperson who is absent from the meeting and in that case and they might if they know it ahead of time they might be able to designate someone ahead of time but if there's an illness an emergency the chair might not be there so I would like whoever would be running the meeting Mr. Lasher um, thank you Ms. moderator in theory if a chair is not there there's an acting chair that's a formal role so whoever is running the meeting for that meeting is the chair okay because my suggestion was to put in chair or acting chair is that that's not necessary so it's just, it, it's known that if the chair is not there then the person acting as the chair could do that also okay um, my next question is where it says number of regular members on the board or committee shall serve for a one-year term little ambiguous to me does it mean they'll be appointed for a one-year term but could serve for many years does that need to be changed or is that clear because to me when I see shall serve for a one-year term I think you mean it's they're appointed for a one-year term but there's no term limit so somebody is appointed every year but they could serve for 10 years or whatever so so should that say shall be appointed for a one-year term Mr. Meares? The one year term, uh, no, this is right, this is okay the way it is. The, um, um, it says they would serve for a one year term. It doesn't say how many, um, it just means they have to be reappointed every year. Okay. Doesn't, th that, there's no limit on the number there's of no limit consecutive and it, I, terms. It, they're appointed for a one year term, but they may serve many terms. That's right. Okay. Um, and then my last, well, another question, however, that any, I don't understand I don't understand the intent of the last part so if if someone is appointed to um, if an associate member is appointed to fill in it, it says to continue to participate in the matter as necessary and to remain qualified what if there's a hearing that goes or just a subject that goes over several months That's right. and the and the full member comes back who then what happens then? The, uh, the point of this is that once, once somebody has been designated to address a particular matter, the, um, that person will continue. So if, if, if the, the, the associate member has uh, been appointed to take the place of the regular member with respect to that particular matter, the associate who was there for the prior meeting will, will continue to serve. The other thing that is that this addresses is if you have more than one associate remember the one who has the longest tenure gets gets appointed and you don't want to be in you still can't hear <laughs> well maybe you wouldn't if you had heard them maybe you wouldn't think they were that wise uh, the it addresses the other question that the person who who is designated as an associate uh, one week had, um, might not be the most senior person the next week, and we don't want this. We don't. We don't want this appointment to be flopping around from different people. So once somebody's uh, uh, appointed to address a particular matter, they continue until but, that but, matter is resolved. But what if the full-time member returns? Same. They they wouldn't be able to. It, it would still. Well, be I mean, the most of the time. They, I mean, yes, it can be for just an, uh, a. a uh, disqualified just simply by being absent but um, uh, frequently when this comes up is the person is disqualified from acting you know because they've got a conflict of interest or uh, or something like that and and so the most common way this will happen is the associate will continue to serve but in any case you certainly it's it it's a judgment but it's a good judgment that the person who who is there for the meeting um, is the person who, who acts rather than the person who was absent. Okay. That would, in fact, be a legal requirement under the Mullen Rule, as you may know. That would be a, a what? A, a legal? legal requirement under the Mullen Rule, as you may know. That um, in, in the Mullen Rule is the rule that says that when you're holding a public hearing, uh, you have to actually be present for 
all of the deliberations. Uh, all of the hearing in order to vote at the end, or now there's a workaround that allows you to review the transcript. Okay, I understand if there's a, if there's a vote on a public hearing, but I'm thinking about a situation where there just might be long-term business within a committee, and you know there might be some small vote. Let's have a, you know just setting a date or something that's small, but it's the full-time member who um, it's the full-time member who might have much more knowledge than an associate member. So, so if something's, you know, if, if a full-time member has been working on an issue for an extended period of time and isn't there for one, you know, one meeting where there's a vote taken and an associate's, that person's now taken off and there's a new person in charge. Well, there's, uh, two, there's two, two safeguards against that. One is this does not require the chair to appoint anybody. So if in the situation where somebody has been working on, on a, a, a matter for a very long time and is unable to attend one thing, it does not mean that, they, that the chair has to appoint uh, an associate member. It sounds like maybe there wouldn't be a vote in that circumstance anyway. So we, we have to assume that the chair is going to um, engage in some sort of thought process. Um, the, um, the other thing is that we've given a lot of wiggle room here by talking about a particular matter. So a particular matter um, um, uh, can be a great big particular matter or a little bitty particular matter, and the chair has some discretion there as to, as to uh, um, what the person is being appointed to work on. Okay. So, I mean, we tried to write it so that we, we're trying to be somewhat prescriptive so that, so that the chair ability to you know, manipulate the vote is, is, uh, is constrained. But at the end of the day, there has to be a little bit of uh, give and take and, and, and sort of common sense in, in how this is, get, is going to be implemented. OK. Well, I guess I have an objection to that on, on two counts. One is that associate members, the work of associate members is sometimes divided up so that one associate member might be working on one project or one line of um, background. Another, so the, the way that committees divide up work amongst associate members, somebody might be working on this, somebody might be working on that, somebody might be working on that. So that even though a person who is less tenured might have more expertise in a particular topic that they're working on. So I think that that allows some leeway. So I would want to strike that. I also, um, we were asked the other night by a member of the uh, Board of Selectmen, you know, um, don't you trust us? And yet what we're hearing is, you know, we don't want chairs to stack votes. So trust goes both ways. I mean, it, I, I think that we need to allow some leeway um, for the way that committees might work which is to divide up work amongst members, which might not be the most tenured person has the most expertise in a particular topic. Um, so I would, I would um, you've, you've explained the other sections that I had, but I would like to strike the part about the most tenured person having to be appointed and leave it that it's at the the discretion of a chair that I hope would be working honestly, so wherever that is. Are you proposing that as an amendment? I am. Okay. The chair may designate an associate member and strike out having the greatest tenure, because I think that, th that the way boards and committees work, it's not the way it might be divided up, it might be a person with a little less tenure. Somebody could have eight years experience, somebody could have 10 years experience. There are long-term associate members, and somebody might have more expertise on something. Okay, is there a second to that proposed amendment? Second, okay. Are you all set? I am, thank okay. you. Okay, Mr. Downing? Oh, she asked you a question, okay. Mr. Barnes? Well, that may be what she meant, but that's not good drafting. Um, so.
I was going to suggest, actually, Bob, if it's if it, uh, Jonathan Barnes, Precinct uh, 5. Um, and, and I don't know, Angela, if you would accept it as a friendly amendment, but, but, but I agree with that, that point. Um, and I'd like to address some comments in a moment. But the suggestion, I think, would be that the sentence would read, if any regular member is absent from a meeting, disqualified from acting, or otherwise unable to deliberate on a particular matter that comes before a board or committee, the chair of such board or committee may designate one or more associate members to deliberate and vote on any matter before the board or committee, semicolon, and then remove if more than one associate member until you get to committee. I, I, I'd leave to provide it however that, and I don't know if you find that as a friendly amendment. Is that a exactly? It's exactly the same. Is that acceptable to the over? Well, Is there any objection? Then we'll consider that the proposed amendment, Mr. Bond. Yes. Yes. Uh, Con continue. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I I think this is um, this is a, a great idea and an important idea, um, and I I support it. Um, I, I also support your comments, Angela. Um, and I urge town meeting to uh, support this as well. I want to also thank uh, the selectmen for their patience uh, with me and my persistence on this. And you, Bob, in particular, um, as we've talked about this, I should point out that I am currently um, an associate member of the Reading Historical Commission. And, and by the way, um, I'm speaking on my own behalf as a town meeting member, but I'm also speaking on behalf of uh, the Reading Historical Commission. Um, and I would welcome any. I know there are other members of other uh, boards and committees who are town meeting members here, and uh, some may be the chair um, of uh, some of those committees as well, who actually have associate members. Th this is very important um, for the committees and the boards of the town to perform the work that they do perform on behalf of the town. And, and it's important for the town to be able to have associate members. I think that. Um, it is as much of the work in this town is performed by volunteers, um, including uh, the selectmen. Um, it's always a good idea to enable more volunteers to participate, and allowing people um, to step up and be associate members, um, I think, does that. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm not um, in favor of um, a limitation such as the two thirds, but. Um, I can certainly live with that. I think that the, that the more people who participate as associates, uh, the better. It, it can do no harm. It can only do good. I would also point out that um, as we are all uh, on boards and committees, volunteers, it is not unusual for some people to um, be absent on occasion. And when you're on a board uh, that may be three or five people, um, that can be extremely detrimental to the work of the board. Um, in the case of either a quorum or as some of the boards require uh, on, as you know, on certain um, permitting processes um, like the demolition delay permit, it requires a supermajority of four. Um, so to allow an associate uh, to step up and fill in in the absence of the regular member is critical um, to enable us not, not just there to be a quorum, but there to be um, a majority, and in any case, um, to have more voices heard on a particular matter um, that's pending before the town in terms of the work of the town, can, again, can only benefit the town. So this is definitely um, a positive, um, and, and I, I support it. Um, I would also point out that, uh, and, and <coughs> folks know, I think that, that this is here because when we did the charter revision, uh, I think in February, um, although there, there was some language in the charter and there are some state laws that address uh, associate members and, and voting um, on some committees. Uh, the charter revision that we approved requires required that in order to 
enable associates to continue beyond this June, uh, there had to be a bylaw addressing uh, the conduct um, and the rules governing associate members. So if this is not approved, there will be no more associate members after uh, June 30th. So I think it is imperative that we have this. Um, I'd also point out, as I said, there, there is existing state law that governs at least associate members and voting on behalf of uh, zoning boards of appeal and on behalf of uh, the historical uh, commission, local historical commissions. I would note um, in support of the, the amendment um, to enable uh, the chair to have the authority to designate um, which associate should step up. I agree with your rationale, um, Ms. Binder's rationale, why that is beneficial um, to enable that flexibility. I'd also point, Bob, to your comment uh, just about 20 minutes ago um, that the town ought to afford um, to its leaders flexibility to make the decisions they are empowered to make. Um, and we ought to do that on behalf of uh, the chairs uh, of the committees um, that we have. And I would note lastly that with respect to the state law, uh, Chapter 40A, I believe, that enables associates and enables voting, um, as well as uh, Chapter 40, uh, Section 8D, which enables associates and voting on the Historical Commission. In both cases, those state laws um, say that the associate member will be designated by the chair, um, and it is not uh, left up, if you will, to the vagaries of the, the senior member. So I think um, this amendment, I support this amendment, and it would, um, it would conform this bylaw to uh, the wording in the state law. I support this, and I urge all of you to support uh, this article and this amendment. Thank you. Before we continue, the town clerk has just informed me that we, your laptop may be about to run out of power. Do you have a, a cord? moderator while I'm trying to prevent that calamity. Um, town Council has suggested that we strike the words provided however that in addition on this on this amendment um, because the last sentence has nothing to do with the prior sentences. This next sentence should properly start with the word any as capital A. So if you'd accept that as a friendly friendly amendment to the friendly amendment. Is, okay any objection to that? No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Greenfield. David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Uh, am, can, can I uh, ask for, there, there were many committees up there and that will have associate members. Um, and there will be, we're talking about designating somebody who will sit at the table and will be a member who can vote. Uh, for the members who are not designated who can vote, who are attending the meeting, uh, are they all allowed to speak at the meeting? Right. Town so, Council says yes. So I think um, uh, it's, a point has been raised about experience. And I think uh, the experience will be in the room and the experience can speak at, at the meetings. And so we're not gonna lose the experience that those, more ex, more, those less tenured, tenured people have. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna vote against the uh, taking out. I think it's important that the chair not have the ability to manipulate the vote. The vote I integrity is important. Um, I think, um, I'd like to see it stay the way it was. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. D'Addario. Uh, Ron D'Addario, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I, I like this uh, in the Climate Committee. This would be helpful because there have been times when we've had to adjourn because we didn't have a quorum, so this would work very nicely. Um, the one thing is the one year. Uh, uh, voting members are, have to be reappointed every three years. One year might sound long, but uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, 
the day may go by slowly, but somehow the years fly by. And so I, I would kind of want to go change. I would like to make, a, again, I hope it would be a friendly mem amendment, and make that at least two years so they, uh, uh, they wouldn't have to go down again and be, uh, you know, go through the process, which is not difficult. I'll, I'll grant you that. But I think two years, um, the person can always step down if they wish. So I would change that to two. Um, okay, so you're proposing that we change the word uh, one year term to two year term? Yes. Okay. And the other thing is. Uh, is there a second? Second, okay, continue. Uh, can, I, can I talk on something else, yes. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> although I can understand the, um, Angela's desire and what she's saying uh, out of respect, et cetera, for the integrity of the chair, I do hold a bit to the previous speaker because uh, assuming the most senior member, uh, all, the most senior um, associate member has been attending meetings possibly for several years. Uh, some of our associate members have been on for quite a while. And they would have heard the arguments. So they might not be an, uh, perhaps a younger member or a less uh, senior member might be an expert in it, but that, uh, that the member with the most longevity would have heard the arguments. They would have been there. And I almost think out of respect for their longevity that they be, I would agree with the way the article was written and allow that longevity to kind of speak for itself. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Munn? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Munn, Precinct 4. First to the amendment of two years instead of one. I fully support that. Uh, speaking from the Conservation Commission standpoint and other, other committees I've been on, it takes a year just to figure out what's going on. So I think uh, being there a minimum of two years is, a, is very important. Speaking to the amendment of um, regarding appointment of associate members to voting privilege, I think we should do everything we can to encourage people to be associate members. It gets them involved in town government. It gives them training before they're a full member. If they know that by being an associate member, they have an opportunity to have an active voice and an active vote in the committee, they'll be more likely to, to step up and be an associate member. If it's always the most senior member, every time somebody's absent, every time somebody has a conflict of interest, it's always going to be that same member that votes. Allowing the chair to appoint the associate member gives the chair and the associate members all an opportunity to participate. And it's not the same longevity member every time. So it would, could rotate if the chair so determined. So I'm very much in favor of the amendment to allow the chair the flexibility to appoint the substitute. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Pacino, Precinct 5, and the, uh, one of the original co-authors of what's in the, uh, the charter on this particular article. And I, first, I want to commend everybody because you kind of very much captured what we had intended when, we, when I originally wrote this. Uh, one of the things we had always done in the, in the original charter is we actually had that there'd be some sort of experienced person who would be stepping up in these positions. And we, and we visualized that this would be something that would be very limited, would not be a, a general thing. It would be more limited in particular situations where that person would step up. And I, I did notice that it said may in the, in the previous paragraph here. So it, it is possible that the chairman, if there's enough people there, if there's five people on the committee and four are there, the chairman uh, may not designate one member because I believe the word may is in there, even though it's not up on the screen, it's on the previous one. Uh, I would not support the amendment as you see it up here. I'd rather see that, that the senior member be, be allowed. We want that experienced person. That was the intent of what the chat was when we wrote the chat with my co-author on that, the experienced person would be there to, 
to make that decision and be a formed decision. As Mr. Greenfield said, the associate members in the room, they can talk. And they can add, they add, their, they can add their expertise and, and their knowledge to the discussion. And you know, I, I would hope that if you're a regular member, even if you're the voting associate member, that you'd be listening. Thank you. Mr. Tafoya. Ben Tafoya, Precinct 4, a couple of quick questions. One is, is it the intent of this to allow for a change in the number of members um, present and available to make quorum? So that if you have two members present on a five-member board, under the current rules, you could not conduct business. So will this allow the chair then to appoint people that will um, allow business then to, to go forward? Um, and then I guess we must have changed that because in the past some other, some of the boards, just a couple, had the right to appoint their own associates. So I think conservation was one. So we changed that in the, char in the charter this last go around. Mr. Meares. The charter allows associate members to be appointed if, so, if a bylaw so provides. <laughs> so um, it's rare that I have to make a microphone higher. Um, the charter, except for, for the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, the charter um, simply says that if they're going to be associate members, a bylaw needs to provide for it. So that's what we're trying to do. Because we, we had changed the previous provisions in the, in the charter when we adopted the new charter this I year. I, I don't think, the, I think the old charter said more, said, said, I don't think the old charter said anything different. It did. Okay. Uh, could you use the microphone? Uh, but Mr. Tavoy yeah, has the. Mr. Yeah. Mon was saying that he believes that we changed it so that now only the selectmen can appoint um, that, associates. But this again, is, in the this is it, the charter. On, the charter says if they're going to be associate members, it need, there needs to be a bylaw that provides for it. Doesn't limit who, what kinds of committees can have it or any other thing. It just says it needs to be a bylaw that provides it. This is a bylaw that will apply to uh, committees that are appointed by the Board of Selectmen. If uh, committees that are appointed by other entities are not covered by this bylaw. So other entities being like the uh, FinCom Appointment Committee or the Bylaw Appointment Committee where there's a member of the Board of Selectmen as members, That's but right. it's not, not covered entirely. by this bylaw. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Graham? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Russ Graham, Precinct 4. Through the years, having been on a number of committees, uh, there are many reasons why you have associate members. One of the most pressing reasons is because you need particular expertise. You need someone, when we started the Economic Development Committee, for instance, there were certain things that we were going to address for the first time. There were people who didn't want to serve fully on a committee, but they were willing to give their expertise. And I think both amendments should be passed because the chair certainly should have the ability to call on the person for that particular area uh, to bring their expertise. So I would support both amendments. And I certainly agree if on lighting fields and taking care of dogs, we're supposed to have great trust in the selectmen, we would hope they and we would have great trust in people they have appointed. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Elijah? Um, if I may, uh, for Mr. Daddario's suggestion of a two-year term, town council has suggested some language up there which is consistent with when we have, for instance, five members in, with three-year terms so that you try to wear, stagger the terms. And I'm just wondering if that additional language would be acceptable as a friendly amendment. 
Mr. Diderio, do you for instance, you might have two associate members, you'd like them to expire each year. Okay, it's acceptable to the mover. Is there any objection? Not appearing. Mr. Sylvester? Did you Mr. Moderator, Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3. Um, I had the pleasure of participating with the uh, Charter Committee in going through this item and uh, also then further reviewing it on the Bylaw Committee. Um, one couple of things that I think are important for town meeting to note are that, uh, number one, this is a bylaw. And if we want to change it in November, because we don't like what we did. We can pretty easily do that. It's much easier than changing the charter. We don't have to jump through hoops. We don't need the state government. And we don't need to mail out uh, 8,000 copies. Um, the other uh, item on here is uh, you know, related to this. We could indeed enact other bylaws um, for other committees so that they may have uh, associates as well. It's just not here. This particular article has a particular subject, and so we're only dealing with this. Um, one other thing to note is that just because the most senior member is the one that has to be first chosen by the moderator, if you have a well-run committee and you have associates that are each a specialist in a certain area, uh, I don't see anything up there that says that that senior member cannot defer to uh, some other member and pass that down. The key here is to eliminate any chances of impropriety. Not saying that, that the chairman, you know, would try and stack the vote, but uh, we had a lot of discussion on this in the charter group, and that was one of the themes that came up. Um, so based on that, I would say that I am not in support of the amendment to uh, remove the, uh, the requirement for the senior person to be selected. Um, as far as one or two years, the selectmen didn't seem to uh, blanch at the idea of having to uh, renew people every year. So if they're willing to do it, um, I don't see a negative to it but uh, I also don't see a negative to going to two years. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sesso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Just a quick question. Um, clearly, I, I, I obviously have had experience with uh, some of the associate memberships that we brought on when I was on CPDC, and for many of the reasons that uh, people have brought up tonight, I, I'm certainly in, very much in support of that. I, I guess one of the questions I have as I listen to the discussion is kind of what do we want people to be doing in these situations? How do we want the chair to act? How, how are we going to guide people so that they take this and translate it into daily practice, if you will, in their committees? And I'm just curious, is there a plan for some sort of training, some sort of information to be shared to the boards and committees so that you know, there is a consistent implementation, um, not only in alignment with the bylaw, but perhaps in alignment with what you know, the vision of the charter change was. Uh, just curious if there was any thoughts to, to kind of do that, because I think that would be helpful to understanding then how we you know, put this in practice. Mr. Lolasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the selectmen have for several months uh, indicated a pretty strong desire to get at least chairs and vice chairs together in a meeting and the better time to do that, the summer is not usually great, uh, but chairs and vice chairs are often changed in July. So sometime after July and when it's convenient would seem to be a good time uh, to review a number of things, um, one of them being the charter, just to make sure that all the boards and committees are on board to everything that's changed. So. The answer is yes, but I can't say exactly when it'll happen or what the format will be. Will, will there be, is it your intent that there'll be maybe perhaps some sort of a written description or policy or guidance doc? I mean, something that, that may be generated to support this? Uh, I would leave that up to the selectmen as to whether they want to prescribe it so exactly or leave it more up to the chairs. Okay. 
Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Monaghan? Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Just one quick comment. If we have a committee chair that has a planned, orchestrated attempt and scheme to stack a vote, I think we have a bigger problem than which associate member is, is, is going to participate. And, and so I, I don't think we should see that as, as the problem. Thank you. Further discussion? Are we ready for the vote? We have two proposed amendments. Which one do we have up there first? Okay. Uh, yeah, if you can flip it easily. Okay. We'll first vote on changing the wording from a one-year term to a two-year term, as so arranged and so forth. Uh, all those in favor of that proposed amendment, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. And now the uh, First Amendment. All right. All those in favor of the proposed amendment, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the chair is in doubt. Do I have my counters from last week? Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Crook, uh, Mr. Rushworth. Uh, uh, Mr. Pacino, would you take the honors for my left and the Board of Selectmen? All those in favor of the amendment, please rise. Nineteen. Nine. Nine. Ten. Ten. Twenty-four. And those opposed? Thirteen. Twenty. Thirteen. Thirteen. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. The vote being 62 in the affirmative, 68 in the negative, the motion does not carry. We will now proceed to the uh, main motion as amended. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 13. Uh, Mr. Brown, do we have a point of order? Oh, you were voting on the main motion as amended. Okay, Article 13. Um, Mr. Brown? Uh, Bill Brown, Precinct 8, move to indefinitely postpone. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Margarita. Uh This was put in on the thought that if we had a board of selectmen that wanted to close the, got angry at Bill Brown and said, well, we're going to close the warrant 60 days ahead of time, uh, that wouldn't be possible, you know, they could do that. But given the recent charter review that says that 200 citizens can uh, get a special election, I don't think they would be willing to have a special election. And okay, thanks. Do we have a bylaw report? Mr. Crook? Stephen Crook, Chair of the Bylaw Committee. At our meeting of March 24th, the Bylaw Committee recommended this article by a vote of 0 to 2. Is there further discussion? Point of order? Pardon me? It, yeah, that is, that is the terminology. So. Uh, the bylaw committee had zero votes for it, two votes opposed to it, and two abstentions. So we're not recommending it. The, the vote to recommend was, was voted down. Okay, further discussion? All right, there's a motion to indefinitely postpone. All those in favor of postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. It is indefinitely postponed. Business on Article 14, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this article is very similar to the rubbish contract with a different topic and a term limit. Um, just to be clear, cell companies have a right to locate uh, their equipment. Now, you heard uh, earlier from the chair of CPDC there will be some discussion on new locations and what rights the town may have. Uh, but for right now, this is an existing site where they already have permission to locate. 
Um, in fact, on the water tower, we actually do have room for one more vendor. This article would authorize the Board of Selectmen to uh, allow them to enter into a longer than three-year contract. Uh, in this particular language, there is a limit. It's a 10-year contract maximum with a 10-year renewal, so theoretically you could have 20 years. What happened last time was four or five years, so a five-year contract with three renewal options. Um, the situation here, as, as I may have described uh, over the last year or two, is the Auburn Street uh, water tank needs to be repaired and painted. There are uh, a number of cell co tower companies up on the water tower. If they took their equipment down, none of us would have cell service in certain parts of town while the work was being done, so they don't want to do that. Um, but it's actually technically a very challenging thing to relocate the equipment so that it still works. Uh, they've, in an unusual display, they've all gotten together and uh, collaborated, um, and they're willing to build a temporary housing uh, for their equipment, and one new vendor wants to join them. They will only do that, and they'll only entertain the undertaking the cost of that if we'll consider uh, renegotiating slash re-procuring their services. So with town meeting's authorization of this article, we would, in this case, um, go out with a formal RFP, and all those companies are willing to, you know, that are willing to bid will bid, and my guess is they they probably may bid together as a group. But right now, um, we don't have uh, much leverage in terms of getting them. We have the ability to get them off the tank, uh, but they have no ability. We want them to stay on the tank and continue to produce revenue for the town. Let's say. Um, if we ask them to get off the tank now and not have this temporary structure, they are not going to spend the money to build it. Uh, they will locate somewhere else, is my guess. So what we're asking is for the selectmen to have the uh, capability of, of issuing an RFP. I'll do that. And then negotiating um, you know, as they see fit. This is a very similar process to what was used um, almost 20 years ago. At the time, um, the market was not quite as competitive as it is now. So I think uh, 20 years is a good maximum. In this case, we're actually deriving revenue, so I don't mind locking in something, uh, whereas when we're paying, I would be a little more reluctant. Um, I will say in general that hindsight is 2020. The lease payments we're getting are below market now, so we'd want to be careful what we're willing to promise or agree to over the, over the future, and with town council's help, we'll take care of that. FinCom report. Mr. McNeese. At our meeting on March 25th, 2015, Finance Committee voted by a vote of 8-0-0 in favor of the article. Is there further discussion? Yes. Ms. Whiting. Carolyn Whiting, Precinct 7. I live within a few hundred feet of the water tower, and my neighbors and I were opposed to the third um, wireless carrier being allowed to install their equipment on the water tower, so um, I am not interested in having an additional transmitter up there, and so I ask that we vote this down. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? Oh, Mr. Lash, I'm sorry. I should add to that last comment. Um, by law, we cannot say no. There is room on the tower. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 15, Ms. Angstrom. Point of order? Where is the point of order? Could you use the microphone, please? I really cannot hear what's being said tonight. So if we could have the technician work. Oh, it's an empty booth. Hey. Somebody. Really, I would appreciate if we could get yes. a little volume. Okay. Uh, Ms. Angstrom. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Okay. 
This article is to authorize the disposition of surplus property. The town is looking to um, dispose of 18 assets, and this first slide shows nine of those assets. You'll notice that these nine are from the DPW department, and they have estimated values between zero and $20,000. This next slide has the last nine assets, four more from DPW, four from police, and one from fire with estimated values of zero to $18,000. Approval of this article will allow the town to sell, exchange, or dispose of these assets accordingly. Vincom report, Ms. Alvarado. Oh, no, Mr. Doxer. At tonight's performance, the part of Ms. Alvarado will be played by Mark Doxer. <laughs> Uh, at our meeting on March 25th, 2015, FinCom voted 800 to recommend this article. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct 8. Uh, it's a typo. It's a Wayne Roy, not a Rain, Wayne Ray. The company name is Wayne Roy on the bucket. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Further discussion? No. None of Yes. Uh, thank you, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, we recently had a case with the light department where a bucket truck or two were um, only advertised in, in a very, um, yeah, I think in local papers, and basically very little advertising. The only person to bid on them was kind of an insider who knew they were being sold. Can you tell me how will these be advertised? Ms. Angstrom? We tend to use a lot of online auction sites now to get m a bigger audience than just posting it in the newspaper, although we do that as well. So th there tends to be a, a wider range of ways that we reach our target market. Further discussion? None appearing. We're ready for the vote. Oh, Mr. Brown? Oh, just voting. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. Sorry. Those opposed? And the motion carries. Business under Article 16, Mr. LaLasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, for those that remember from last week, um, this is the ideal kind of debt where some of it is free, it's a grant, and then some of it is promised as low interest, which right now is 0% interest, although that's not promised. Um, town meeting needs to vote to authorize um, debt in this case, even though it's the MWRA effectively loaning us the money at at zero percent. Um, it's also nice that they've changed the split um, to be more favorable in terms of there's more grant money in there now than as a percent than, than there used to be. You can see the amounts listed. Uh, phase eight has already been approved by town meeting. So um, the actual motion is the two 211 pieces in there. And this is um, every so often the MWA um, again approves and authorizes phases they allocate according to how much money you spend in their system um, in terms of the assessment. They allocate out uh, this grant loan program for you to fix your leakage in the system because they don't have any desire to have more capacity and neither do you. FinCom report, Mr. Doxer. At our meeting of March 25th, FinCom voted 800 to recommend this article. Further discussion? Yes. Bob Lynch, Precinct 6. Uh, sidebar issue. Um, they just dropped about 20 or 30 sewer pipes on Arcadia Ave this afternoon. In the afternoon, coming from the Barrow School, there's between 150 and 200 cars. And I'm wondering how long those sewer pipes are going to be on Arcadia. I assume they're for West Street. Mr. Lasher? Who is they? <laughs> I don't know. Who has sewer pipes? Well, we have some. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know anything about it. I'll find out. I mean, on Arcadia, did you say? It's on Arcadia right. just before uh, Shelby. Okay. Um, even if they took them hmm, farther into the development, there's a cul-de-sac down the end sure my neighbors down there wouldn't be happy to see those pipes, but it's created a hazard there with all the cars that are coming by. I bet the kids love them. 
Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote, but we'll try a hand count first. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. Business under Article 17, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Uh, I'd like to ask permission of the Chairman of the Board of Trustees to come forward, Ms. Moderator, if that's all right. Yes, as a member of the Board of Jen. Trustees. She's better looking than I am. And she also tries to keep me in to, uh, to, uh, to. Thank you. Uh, while she's coming down, you can see our lovely building behind us. A uh, little history on it. The per building to your left was purchased in 1924 for $685.50, including the land. Uh, the building to the right of that was an 1898 tool shed in the back of the thing, and it brought up and attached to it. The uh, comment in the paper at the time, or the, excuse me, the town report at the time was they could finally bring in tools that they had off site. So that's what we're trying to do, bring our cemetery in the cemetery building. Thank you. Now, uh, we're going to flip through the pictures a little bit if you go along. Uh, another side view of the building. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Uh, this one really doesn't show you too much. Uh, this is the back end of the building where it was jacked up in the, at the time they parked the company truck in there. I guess it was probably a Model T around 1924. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Uh, this really doesn't show you too much either. But this is the... Uh, uh, present backhoe, and this was the addition that was put on in 1953 to house the then backhoe. And if you ever want to watch an experience, go down there someday and see the gentleman try to put this away. He has to do a dance with it. Uh, this is one of the. This is the back end of the backhoe, and you can see how tightly they have to get in there. This is one of the older trucks. With the new trucks, he can no longer get both trucks in the building. Thank you, Bob. And this is the downstairs that you saw where the storage of the lawnmowers. Uh, we have uh, hired a cube every month, and that does help take away some of the strain and make it a little easier and safer for the boys. Thank you. And another one of the view downstairs. To the left and to the right of the uh, thing is where we store the veterans' markers and the firewood before. Uh, is the main source of heat. Well, not the main source, but the best source of heat in the building. Go ahead, Bob. And this is the sweeper and the other little wing underneath the thing. So. And this is the attic. Uh, like most attics, this is where all the junk is kept. Uh, they do buy interchangeable stuff with the parks department, so they sometimes do have spare parts. Thank you, Bob. And again, the upstairs in the attic. So that's about the... Oh, and again, going back to the original building. Now bear in mind that the last addition on this building was 1950s, and we only had two cemeteries at the time. He had more help than he did today. And interesting, when Bob, talking to Bob Keating, the director this morning, he came here 25 years ago. He put a new roof on it, so sometimes uh, before long, a new roof is going to have to be done on us or a new building, and the same way with the heater. So that's the extent of that. Now, in the town meeting's budget, town manager's budget, he continually states that the town's going to have to find ways to do things better. Well, if the cemetery department is consolidated with the rest of the DPW down a new crossing load, as, as the selectmen wish to see, it's going to cost the cemetery department between ten dollars and $12,000 a year to have men riding in trucks doing absolutely nothing. They could take that extra 15 or half an hour a day and spend it in the cemetery taking care of your grave so eventually and mine. My reservations are already made. Uh, except for snow plowing, the department has no other interaction with the rest of the DPW. We don't do paving. We don't dig water. We don't dig sewer lines. We dig graves. 
molons and plant bodies. Of the 12 communities, 12 communities that we like to compare ourselves with, not one, let me repeat that, not one of those communities have the cemetery department in with the DPW, including Lexington and they just built a brand new facilities. Uh, we feel that the cost comparison of storing our equipment is going to be about the same whether it's a standalone building or in conjunction with a consolidated building down at the uh, present DBW site or some other site that the Board of Selectmen might know that I don't. The cost of renovation for the DPW site, present DPW site, is $22.4 million. The interesting thing about it, the design people came up with 52 parking spots. There's 65 full and, uh, and part-time DPW employees. So where are they going to put them? I don't know. The FinCom has stated that they'd like to see the new building committee and look at both sites, the present site and other sites, and, and redo it. Well, we did that 30 years ago. We looked at every piece of property in this land. There's several of us here, sitting here tonight to remember it. There is no other piece of property. You're going to spend $22.4 million for a remodeled DPW site. Weston and Sampson, the people that the town hired to do it, said they wouldn't spend that kind of money down there because of the wetlands. They suggest it would be not a prudent way to spend money. We're looking for a standalone, independent building that we can be, uh, be proud of. And I'll turn it over to Jan. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, town meeting members. I'm Jan Baronian. Um, I think you might. Yeah. Should I lift it up? Is that better? A little closer. How's that? Okay. Um, I serve as a trustee. No? What am I? Can I just hold it? Don't, like this? Am I doing okay? All right. As a trustee of the Town of Reading's uh, Cemetery Board, um, I just wanted to point out that what Bill is saying is really correct. And if anybody's had the chance to look at all four cemeteries, we are really unique because most of the communities that we compare ourselves to do not have four cemeteries. And there is a lot of time that is going to be taken up going from one cemetery to the other, coming from the DPW. Traffic is only getting worse, and we will be stuck in traffic, especially in the morning during the commuting hours. Every cemetery in our community is unique, especially our historic Laurel Hill. And if you take a look at how beautiful that has been kept, and it's not an easy task because it's an older cemetery with a lot of hills and fragile slate and marble stones, but yet we spend a lot of time with our crews in there taking care of it, and I just hate to lose that time and have it deteriorate. Along with the other cemetery that's an older one is Forest Hill, and we have that beautiful hill of veterans, and that is something that's always taken care of very nicely, especially around Memorial Day when we have the flags out. We're one of the few communities that um, has the opportunity to put a flower on each veteran's grave. I just would not like to see these cemeteries deteriorate because of the inefficiency of traveling from a DPW site. Um, and I'd like to see more time being able to be spent in these cemeteries. So that's why I ask you for your support. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Um, the other day, the Board of Selectmen handed out accolades for everybody department, and I'd like to point out that with the amount of snow we had this year, there was not one delayed burial. They would got everybody in time when they're supposed to be, and that's a good compliment to the boys, and they do a heck of a job. Doing my family genealogy, I visited many, many cemeteries, and I got to tell you, Reading should be proud. There's four gentlemen full time and two part time for 52 acres of land. That's not an awful lot. And every minute you take away by travel from DPW site or whatever site that the 
uh, selectmen may have in mind uh, is time that could be spent in the cemetery. And eventually, I hope that they can take care of my grave. Thank you. Income report, Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At our meeting of March 25th, 2015, uh, the Finance Committee voted not to support this article. Our vote to recommend was 080. The committee believes that a townwide assessment is needed in looking at buildings and facilities for DPW, cemetery, and other potential needs. The Permanent Building Committee is the correct place for this type of assessment to take place, which has just now been approved, and then report back to the town on proposed actions. Further discussion? Dr. Rinspinger? Uh, Mr. Moder, I'm going to move to refer Article 17 to the Permanent Building Committee. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Rensminger? Uh, yes. Uh, Bill, uh, I toured that building with you, and I think many of your arguments are meritous, but I think the proper procedure here is to utilize this new body in town. Uh, we will be getting around to appointing it. Uh, actually, the appointing body will be doing that. Uh, there's an interesting motto on the wall inside. It says, uh, our day begins when yours ends. So that, I took that one away, and I took a lot of pictures. Uh, but I, I think that is the proper place for this. And I think there is a technicality here in that the capital improvement plan, I believe, only has 1 million, 1.5 million. And this motion is for 2 million. So this, the, the amount here is actually technically out of order, Mr. Moderator, I believe. It's so. not out of order, but it may not be. It may I, right. you'd have to talk to the town council yes. about its uh, what what the result would be. Okay, but uh, I believe this should be referred to the building committee. Just as a, a side note, uh, this is a motion we don't have too often. Referring to committee, if you should vote to do that, it would send this to the committee, and it would be uh, dead for this town meeting. Further discussion, Mr. Brown. Dan, I, I'd hope you'd be careful when you use the word body. That's what we reserve for the cemetery department. Uh, no. Uh, again, I go back to the 1985 study. There were three different studies that year to determine with the present site of the DPW. They looked at every piece of property in this town. There is no other piece of property to do what they're suggesting, combine everybody. There isn't. At that time, the, uh, I don't see Jack Russell here, but uh, at that time Jack Russell was on the thing and they were thinking of the Nike site where the, bear, or the ice skate ring was now, but the silos were still in place. And then, uh, and again, unless the selectmen know or have created overnight eight acres or nine acres, there is no other land. And you can form another committee, we can wait another year, they'll come up with the same conclusion. There is no more land in this town to put eight, eight acres or some of that. I mean, and again, it will be time consuming for the cemetery department to spend that time traveling uselessly. Thank you. Further discussion, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Uh, several points. Uh, my husband and I went to the open house that um, Bill and company uh, sponsored there at Laurel Hill and um, saw all the conditions as they are now, which are very difficult, I think. And this uh, idea of replacing this garage has been around for many years. I think that the cemetery building should be, um, I think we're not here to debate the location of the DPW. I think the cemetery division should be north of town where all the cemeteries are. It doesn't make any sense to me if we have the DPW down at Walker's Brook to have the cemetery trucks adding into the congestion over there and on Washington Street if all, and going through town when all the cemeteries are north of town. I think this is a separate thing from the location of the DPW uh, entire site. I also think it's not in the purview of the building committee to determine the site of any of these buildings. I read, um, as far as I know, that is not one of the powers that we gave to the committee. When I voted to establish, um, when I cast my vote to establish the permanent building committee, it was with the, uh, the intent that they would oversee projects, not tell us where they're going to put the buildings. I don't think that's within their purview. So, um, 
and if people don't vote this tonight, I still don't think it belongs um, up to the permanent building committee, excuse me, I'm not talking clearly, uh, to determine this location. Just as town meeting years ago determined, and I think they made the best decision to locate the um, new police station, so I think it's up to town meeting when they're making these investments to have a say in that. Um, I, would like to I would like to support this. The, um, the handout that Bill had um, out in the lobby indicates an estimated amount of $1.8 million. Um, so I think we can amend that if necessary, but I would urge everyone to, it's time to do this. And it's a simple design, a good placement north of town, and I um, am strongly in support of this. Further discussion? Mr. D'Addario? Uh, Ron D'Addario, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to support Bill as well on this. I think he's, he's been here, I don't know how many years, trying to do this. I've got to give him credit. It seems like the best place to have it is just where it is. Um, I think the time has come. It should go to the building committee, but that would be not, not for location, but to assist in building it properly and to do it, doing all that to get the most out of the building. And the, the last thing I think out of a courtesy to Bill would be to, uh, that we could perhaps name the new building after him. I think I would certainly go along with that as well. Thank you. Do Dr. Ensminger? Hopefully we can get some clarification from either someone who is on the bylaw committee or town council about the scope of the building committee, whether or not it extends to siting. I was under the impression it did extend to siting. So can someone in authority please clear that up? Mr. LaLazier. Okay, go ahead. There's a question if it's going to the building committee. Um, I think I read the article the other day on the new bylaw. It says any project in excess of $2 million. We're not in excess of $2 million. We are $2 million. And the reason we did the $2 million, quite frankly, it was figures based upon uh, John Zamboros, the town engineer, that was given him for the present Western and Sampson site remodel down there. And we want to make sure that we have a roof on it, unlike some other building. Bob? Okay, while you're looking, we'll continue. Um, Mr. Berman? Barry Berman. As um, the person who sort of conceived and brought to town meeting the idea of the building committee, um, it, it was in my intention, and I think maybe the intention of the body when we voted it, was to have for the building committee to assess the feasibility of a new project or a renovation of an existing project. And certainly, citing where a building goes is all part of the feasibility. So while it might not state it um, specifically in the bylaw, I think it's well within the scope um, of um, where, uh, it, where the building should be in place A or place B um, as part of its whole uh, assessment of the feasibility of a project. So um, that was certainly the intention um, when I know when I conceived it and I think when you guys voted on it. But I'll leave that up to town council. Further discussion? Mr. Tuttle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dave Tuttle, Precinct 3 and CPDC and Zoning Advisory Committee and a few other things. Uh, I've been in town meeting for more than 10 years. This issue of the cemetery building and the maintenance facility has come up at every town meeting that I remember. It's time to do this. The, I'm presuming, I haven't had a chance to go through the, the detailed plan, the extra space that's required appears to be available where the current building is. And I mean, with all due respect uh, to the cemetery committee and, and the rest of the town, 
it's time to just say yes and do it. Further discussion? Mr. Graham? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Russ Graham, Precinct 4. Those who have been around a while know I never pass off an opportunity to support Bill Brown. Um, <laughs> but uh, as has just been pointed out, this is getting a little tiring. Year after year after year, we have discussed this without resolution. I am a great supporter of the Permanent Building Committee. I think when it gets appointed, it will do wonderful work. But this is a long-standing problem that needs to be solved. It's our decision to solve it. And I, too, would like it to have a plaque on it that called it the William C. Brown Building, as long as we're careful that it doesn't become the William C. Brown Memorial Building. <laughs> and uh, so with that, I would urge our support of this. Mr. Lasher, were you ready? Or? Oh, you have it up? OK. Ms. Doctor? Uh, Nancy Doctor, Precinct 1. I'm going to support this for two very simple reasons. I don't think we need the building committee to tell us the building has to be replaced. You can see that from the pictures. And no offense to the finance committee, but if Mr. Brown says this is the least expensive way to address this problem, I am going to vote for this. Thank Further you. discussion. Uh, Mr. Greenfield? David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Uh, am I correct if, if the um, building committee has the authority, uh, they, they can fully consider Mr. Brown's uh, points and incorporated into their planning and potentially recommendation. Am I correct? Mr. Lelasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the building committee can completely agree with everything that Bill has just proposed, or it can pick some other path. Right. And, uh, and, the, and the building committee being formed soon, uh, it, this has gone on a long time. We have heard this a lot, and there is no question there's a need. Uh, with, the, with the building committee being put together soon and starting, is there an expectation of when they'll sit down and put things like this on the table so that this project can be considered in the broader context of other similar needs to come to that conclusion? Is there an expectation of a time frame that, that this will unfold? Mr. Lasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, somewhat surprisingly, the, the bylaw was just approved on Thursday. Uh, much much longer than we expected. Um, that's going to cause this, the appointing authority to probably act in June, you know, another month from now, because we have to post vacancy, and we couldn't do that before it was approved. So realistically, the first meeting of a building committee, we're probably looking at late June. How they choose to conduct themselves after that, I, I really couldn't say. I, I'm... I'm uh I would like I would like to see this put in that broader context of uh, of planning. Uh, I think there's no question there's a need. I think uh, if I was going to decide today, I have a feeling it does belong here. Uh, but I'd like to see it put in uh, into a broader plan and discussed uh, back here with town meeting once again. But but with progress, actual progress from the committee behind it by by the time we meet again in November. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Morita. Uh, a question for town council. As I read this, it says exceeding two million. We're not exceeding two million. We are at two million. So therefore, in my opinion, and I, I'll differ, differ with you, we don't have to have the building committee. It says exceeding. Mr. Meares. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that says exceeding, and the proposal here is to limit the, um, uh, the expenditure to $2 million. And so you're not exceeding. So you're absolutely right about that. Um, you may also, you, you, as in response to the previous question, 
uh, about the jurisdiction of the Permanent Building Committee to uh, make recommendations regarding the siting. You can see that, um, that the language of the bylaw um, refers to, and I have to turn my head to read it, oversight and management of all major municipal and school building design studies and construction projects. I think we probably have to have some experience w under that before we, we make a, uh, uh, a judgment as to whether that's broad enough, but it sounds to me that that language does not include um, the siding. Um, so it, it does not include decisions about siding. Uh, so um, there is at the bottom a paragraph that suggests that there's going to be an inventory of uh, of uh, existing facilities, which is the purpose of which has to do with siting. So I think that they are going to be expected to make some contribution to the to the uh, uh, to the siting decisions. But the siting decisions are not, in fact, to be made by the permanent building committee. Um, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. In the, um, in the background, I tried to write up um, my thoughts. And I think it's, it's at least very clear to me that this is a joint effort, that this is a, a big situation. It's, it's not just a small situation. And it should be a collection of boards. It should be a building committee, it should be the finance committee, and it should be the board of selectmen that collaborate on this. Um, I agree with everything Mr. Brown says, perhaps except a conclusion. And, I, and pictures don't lie. And the sad story is if we took pictures of the DPW yard, it's very similar, not as bad, very similar to this. And the lesson this has uh, certainly taught me and should teach everyone, um, we've cut the department from 120 odd employees to 40 over the last 25 years. We bought a lot of equipment, some of it quite large. We thought that was a prudent financial decision to make the 40 workers more effective. Apparently what was missed in all this is you're buying more equipment and it's larger, you need a good facility for it. So that should have been implicit in the thought of a conscious decision to go away from employees and toward equipment. There's an extra cost in there, which is eventually you're going to have to build a facility. Um, I agree with the comment that was made, there's a range of 18 to 22 million dollars. Um, I'm not sure I would put 18 million dollars at the current site. The Board of Selectmen is engaged in discussions with an alternative site in Reading. It does have the proper space. It's a subject of executive session, so I won't say more. And I can't say that it's going to work out. Um, but I will say this is a big thing. It's a big project. It has a large impact on the town's uh, future financially. And that's why I think it should be a multi-board effort and discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Bonazzoli first, and then I'll come back to uh Phil. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James Fonzoli, Precinct 6. Um, I, I, too, am actually in favor of uh, supporting Mr. Brown's motion and, and not delaying. Uh, Mr. Brown, we actually did a study while I was on the board my last year there, the Weston Sampson study that he was mentioning. And I, I like the board's opinion, for one thing, I assume this building committee is going to remove the, um, the amount of consulting fees that we've been paying, because I, I, I don't see why we, we paid uh, 50 or $100,000 for Sampson and Wesson to go through the various sites and determine which was the best site and start doing some design factors, but I don't think we actually got to, to that piece. We stopped them at, at that point. So, by voting in favor of this, we move it forward, and then the building committee uh, then can then uh, work on what they're chartered to do, which is the design aspects and not picking it. So I say we, we move forward, get this off the ground, and then you guys can do what you like to do with the building committee. Thank you. Mr. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Pacino, Precinct 4. Um, 
I'm concerned now. I hear the word cost here. I don't see anybody presenting a finance, financing plan as to how we're going to pay for this. Are we going to go for an override? Are we going to go to the taxpayers? Are we going to ask them for more money? Where is the plan that's going to come up with a financial plan? I don't see it. You know, we say we're going to borrow. Who's going to pay for this? Are we going to have to cut Bob's budgets by $2 million somewhere to pay for this? Or are we going to have to go for an override to the taxpayers to pay for this? I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a bean counter. I don't see the, the financial plan that's being presented here. All I see is discussion about jurisdiction, siting, and nobody's talking about cost and the taxpayers. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Phil, I believe, and town manager can correct me, and I'm sure he will, uh, that there's $3, three million dollars in the capital plan that was supposed to be, be split between uh, cemetery and DPW. That was the original starting out, uh, and Mr. Barnazoli was on the board at the time when we did this. And that was the original thought, was just to do some repairs down at DPW. And then when the plan got to this, the original vote, excuse me, let's go back a little bit. Um, there was money approved for a study on the DPW site. There was money approved for the cemetery site, uh, consultant work. There were two separate uh, years. When it got to the cemetery end of the money, the then uh, facilities director did not sign the contract because the money came in over budget, and rightfully so. I would not have in her position. So we got dropped at the one yard line. But there is money in the capital plan, Phil, $3 million in the capital plan to, to carry this out. And we think it's it should go there. And we would be quite willing to work with a building committee. However, if you read the article again, and the town council has said, we're not exceeding, so therefore, in my opinion, we don't need the building committee, but we're quite willing to work with them if that's what it takes to get it done. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Mr. LaLasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mr. Brown's right. Unfortunately, in terms of Mr. Pacino's question, the debt service isn't scheduled till FY18. So if it's moved up faster than FY18, particularly into FY16, we have no resources allocated to it right now. Further discussion? Yes. Marianne Downing, Precinct 3. Um, am I missing just is do you already have a design for this in place if I were going to support this? How do you know it's going to come to two million dollars? Mr. Brown We took the two million based on the figures that Weston and Sampson gave the town engineer to redo the present site down on uh, Walksbrook Drive and he deliberately went a little high that we felt was zero um, I've gone through a lot of figures and everything else. I think it possibly, in my own opinion, could be one million seven five, but I don't know. And again, I like to repeat, we've gone into two other projects in this town and we've had to come back for money. I'd rather have too much and bring it back to you and say, you know, we can bring it in one seven or one seven five. Now that's that's my reason. Okay, and then just I Again, because I'm new to this issue, no, to, to understand the scope of the problem, I don't want to sound morbid, but how no. many burials do we have a day that we're, our trucks are sitting in the traffic? Is this a, a daily problem? It's not the amount of burials. Pro, uh, we have approximately 125 burials a year, be they full burials or uh, cremations. It's the maintenance of the cemeteries day after day. We have four full-time persons and two seasonal people to take care of 52 acres. Uh, when this building was built that you saw up here, there was only two cemeteries. Well, at the time that it was originally built, there was one cemetery. Uh, Forest Glen was just coming on board. We've added two cemeteries since. When Bob Keating, our present superintendent, came here, he has seven people. We're down to four to do the same work. There's a lot of little incidental work that you don't know. When you go, when you have a funeral, you look at the beautiful spreads that they put out there. The day after, they have to go out. Each and every one of those have to be taken apart, 
because you can't throw the flowers in the trash. They have to be separated. And all, a lot of little things. Every time you put in a headstone, that adds to the amount of weed whacking you have to do. It cuts, it increases the amount of uh, mowing time because now you have to dodge around that headstone. And it's all the little things that they're adding up. Presently, in the present building, everything that they handle has to be done twice. I watched, went down, uh, helped Mr. Driscoll put out the uh, markers one morning. It took them a half an hour to get the equipment out of the building, onto the trailers, and gone. And they couldn't do it any faster. And that's what we're saying. We so have the garage is causing that problem? What's that? The, the, the state of the present garage is yeah. causing those? Yeah, it was built for Model Ts. And like Bob says, and to go along with what Bob says, we're buying bigger equipment. Back in 1985, when some of us warned where the present building was built, we suggested a bigger building. We were told, oh, no, don't need it. Uh, because this town is cheap at times, uh, and I'm one of them, okay? <laughs> but uh, no, there's, there's a time to spend the money wisely, and I think this is a time to wisely, and I, I you know, but if there's any more of the questions, I'll gladly answer. It's just the last question, and this sure. kind of goes to what the last commentator said and what Mr. Yeah. Lalesha said. So there's no money now, it would have to be an override, but no. FY, FY18, I know there was that issue with the allocation and dropping on the one yard line. Like, no. So if we waited to FY18, is there money in the budget for it? So could, could this wait a year? What, what we're asking is the authorization. We'll wait the year if that's what it takes for the money. Oh, I see. We, we, if that's the, the setback, we want the building. Okay. And we want to give the guys tomorrow morning and say, hey, look, you're going to get a new building. I don't know if you've ever been in there. But I actually walked in one day, and the guys were rebuilding an engine on top of their lunch table. I don't know how many people would like that. That's the only place they have to rebuild an engine. So this is just an authorization, but the money doesn't have to be spent this year. It just has to be well, spent someday. If, if we don't have it, we can't get it, I'm sure. But we would like the authorization to have it. OK. And thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes. Uh, thank you again, Bruce McKenzie, Precinct 8. Um, I'd like to offer a f what I hope is a friendly amendment to Bill that might avoid some ruffled feathers, which is um, after the word town manager, say, in consultation with the building committee. And while you're thinking about that, my reading of it, this article, is that it authorizes but does not require us to build it. So we might as well go, he go ahead and let them start the planning. And uh, a comment is, I think $2 million is pretty expensive, unless it's a much larger, fancier thing than I expect. So after the word town manager, um, after the word town manager, Bill, would you be willing to add, in consultation with the building committee? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, we're, we're willing I, I, to work I, with the building committee. Yeah, no yeah I think that's just a reminder that everybody has to work together. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the building committee. I'm sure I can convince them that it's the only site. So is that uh, acceptable to the proponent? Yes. Is there any objection to that? Yes, you have an objection to that? Mr. Coco, did you have an objection? Oh. Richard Coco, Precinct 4. <coughs> Excuse me. I've inherited a cold. Number one comment, if you're going to rebuild an engine, take it to DPW. That's where it belongs. My one comment is, where is the money coming from? Okay, before we, before we continue, I was asking if there was any objection to adding that to the, uh, to the main motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Then okay, I there is, so not appearing, we'll accept that as part of the main motion. Continue, Mr. Coco. Thank you very much. My one question, and it's voiced by other people, where is the money coming from? Earlier this evening, we were told by the FinCom that fiscal year 17, fiscal 18 are going to be financially a problem. Here we go, spending 20 million, perhaps, potentially, for a garage, for the cemetery department, 
Monday, a million dollars for lighting. When is it going to end? Because frankly, you're driving a lot of the people who built this town up out because taxes continue going up and they can't afford the real estate tax. This spending has to start being contained. It's a sober statement. And I don't see it. I frankly do not see it. Thank you. Now, there was a person who would, uh, yes. Thanks, I'm Heather Klisch from Precinct 7. And following, I, I have a question. Um, we were just, I was just hearing people say that this was a request to authorize. And the language in the motion that I'm looking at says vote to appropriate the sum. So I, I have a similar question of how the funding would come and if we're making a distinction, and I'm sorry, I'm new to this in the town meeting format, between authorize and appropriate for the capital plan. Mr. Mr. Lelazier. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'll say practically there's no difference. Uh, when debt is undertaken, the Board of Selectmen have to authorize by signature any debt. So they're the final word, if you will, on, on debt, on borrowing. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. Um, Bill, I just have a question, um, and it, it you know, kind of goes back to, the, to some of the issues we've had in the past. Uh, recently, the library project where we appropriated money up front and then found out later that it was going to cost more. You know, I guess one of the questions I have, especially given the circumstances, why didn't you come here, for example, with a, a modest request for a design study or something smaller just to determine what this was going to be? Because I, I, I mean, I support the idea of what you're trying to accomplish. I, I, I sense the frustration over the years. But you know, one of the things is, okay, here we go again, another building project, and you know, certainly it has a defined need, and there's a there's a clear purpose for it. But from a financial perspective, the question I would ask is maybe instead of, especially where it may seem like you know we're probably a year or so away before money's in a in a financial budget to support this, to do a smaller. I don't know, you know, hundred thousand dollar design study and plans and for purpose to come up with. Okay, this is really what it's going to be. Uh, I don't know how to answer that, John. If you looked at the model I made outside, it will fit on the lot, and I guarantee you, I could probably build it for two million bucks, less than two million. And again, we want to make sure that we didn't have to come back. And these figures that I took again are come from the town uh, engineer which were taken from Weston and Sampson's estimates of what it would cost to remodel down that new crossing road. Bear in mind, you're going to spend approximately the same amount of money, whether it's a standalone building or combined with DPW. The ultimate saving is going to be in the time. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not okay. arguing that point, and I, I have yet to hear the board or the committees convince me of yeah. why we should wait, uh, given the circumstances. But yeah. having said that, I, I, I'm still... I'm still hesitant to authorize a $2 million expenditure, um, and I don't want you to have to come back, but you know, I certainly would, you know, you're gonna spend the money on the design aspect anyhow. Right. Um, I would have, I guess I would have said, wouldn't that have been a more appropriate thing to come to town meeting with? It's a smaller amount of money. It could be allocated now. We could actually do the work now to determine and then come back and say, okay, based on you know, a PE design, this is what it's going to cost. Now, I, I mean, the town engineer may have done it, but nobody's standing up here and saying, here's our official cost estimate, and this is what we're going to uh, no, assign up no to. Official, there was no official process, John. So, I, um, and part of it, quite frankly, it was a lot of frustration upon the cemetery board. We got to the one-foot line with Mr. Bonazzoli's last time, and we were waiting for the selectmen, waiting for the selectmen, so we're, look, we're, we're going to take the thing. We, have, we felt that we had nothing to lose by coming to ask town meeting. Um, if you turn it down, the building will still be there tomorrow morning. Um, and I, get, I, I suggest, again, go in and look at the building. Oh, I, again, I'm, okay. I'm, not, I'm not arguing the purpose. Yeah. I'm not yeah. arguing the, yeah. the need. I'm just trying to figure out, uh, again, given some of the questions that have been raised, given what we're trying to face, given yeah. some of the financial issues, given the way the budgeting purposes work, 
I'm just, I'm just curious. It would have been, a, in my mind anyhow, would have been an, a, a, maybe a more tenable, a more appropriate approach. It, 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 it certainly wouldn't have been a full $2 million chunk. Um, it would have been something that we could actually have some tangible work done on up front. Well, um, but that, that's okay. We, I, I we, had no, we had no budget to go out and hire a consultant, John. Well, uh, and uh, and you could have come to town meeting, and yep. that's what I'm saying. You could have come to town meeting or could have worked with the finance committee yep. in the town for that. And I, I certainly think it's a much more tenable situation given where we are today. All right, Mr. Lelasher. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I guess we're having trouble with overheating equipment, so it'll come in and out. Yeah, too, too much hot air. Bill and I up front would solve that problem. Um, I want to alert town meeting to a technicality that we've, we've given a lot of thought to and it was really impossible to solve. Um, the budget in front of you is the Finance Committee budget for FY16. Including in that is the capital plan. The Finance Committee voted zero to eight on this article. So the actual capital plan has a one and a half million dollar cemetery garage in it. We could not change it to two million because the FinCom did not approve that. And so it could not be presented to you. So if you approve this article, um, for $2 million, we cannot legally borrow $2 million until that one and a half million is changed. Um, there was just no way around that sort of logical difficulty in this situation. So what I'm telling you as a practical matter is it's gonna take another vote of town meeting before we could actually borrow $2 million. And that's gonna require next November's town meeting. So you can authorize the debt at $2 million now and I guarantee you that bond council will say no because you do not have $2 million in your capital plan. Bill is right that there's two one and a halves. One is meant for DPW yard work, it's very clear. One is meant for cemetery garage. So that was a logical problem that we dealt with all along that's just really not surmountable. It takes a second act of town meeting. Mr. Doxer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mark Doxer, Precinct One and, and uh, Finance Committee. One of the reasons why I think we all looked forward to having this permanent building committee was so that we could bring in some expertise to make assessments on projects to make sure we didn't have great overruns, to take a look at the whole idea. Are we doing the thing the best way we can? Are we incorporating future needs? Are we going through that? My concern with this article is that we haven't had a chance to do that yet. And whether the number is 1.5 or 1.7 or 2 or 2.5, it's a big number. And it's a number that I think deserves more time and effort to go through it. In, in my view, that's what the Permanent Building Committee was meant to do. And, that, and I think Mr. Sasso hit it right on the head. Um, that's exactly what we should be doing. I don't think anybody disagrees with the need. I don't think that's the issue at all. It's more an issue of, of kind of how we're going to look forward or how we're going to look at spending a substantial amount of money like this and just to make sure that we do it in a, in a fashion whereby we're all comfortable as town meeting members, as uh, taxpayers in the community, that we've really taken a look at this, figured out the best way to do it, decided if there are other needs that should be north of town as well, perhaps. I don't know that that's been considered. That's the kind of thing that I'd hope the building committee could do. And with a, a, uh, an assessment done early on at a modest amount of money, maybe we can get that done as well. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Sylvester, Precinct 3, and also Bylaw Committee. Um, just to share with town meeting members, the Bylaw Committee, in its work on trying to craft this Permanent Building Committee bylaw, we tossed around the number many, many times as to where the limit should really be. Um, we had limits as low as a couple hundred thousand dollars, and. Uh, um, after uh, prudent discussion, I think among the members of the bylaw committee and the town manager and, and others, we arrived at the, the number of two million. We really wanted to exclude some more expensive repairs and things that might happen to uh, school buildings or, or other town buildings where we might indeed spend a million and a half uh, replacing a roof and we didn't feel that we needed the building committee in order to, to do that. Um, so we settled on the number of, of two million. Um, 
the intent is we want to give this committee a, a chance. And um, as a town meeting member, I do take exception to dancing around the number that we're just under two or we're just over two. Um, I have no doubt that we need this garage. And it needs to be somewhere. It either needs to be part of DPW or needs to be separate. I agree. But I really think we need to let this permanent building committee get itself going. And we need to take advantage of that. We need hard numbers. We need to make solid decisions based upon hard numbers. And these are hard decisions that we need to make that we're expecting the townspeople to pay for. So I really believe that we should let the building committee uh, do its job, and it's going to take some time to get that going. Further discussion? Mr. O'Neill? John O'Neill, Precinct 4. It seems to be, you know, somebody said it when we had the discussion about the lights, you know, a, a patent in some ways. It's, uh, it's very interesting, it's fascinating almost to watch it. We're talking about, we're really not talking about just the, the money for the cemetery and how we're going to come up with that money. We're talking about either keeping it separate or tying it in with a larger expense. And the reality is there's a, the selectmen are looking at, and I can see it now, I don't want this to be held hostage to a proposal that then they're going to say, well, because we're going to have both of these things together, the cemetery and the DPW, we need to have this radical, and that was the way it was described, you know, idea, and I can only think of one place in town. And I know, I think the radical is probably not a serious enough word if, it, if I'm correct in where it might be placed. But I certainly don't want to see, at very least, the cemetery project. And as far as haven't we learned the lesson in this state and even within the town with our schools, when you defer things, it costs you more. You know, it's not like everybody, so when everybody agrees, oh, it needs to be done, but, you know, maybe we put it to the building committee, you know, and then we talk about the cost. Yeah, cost, but we're talking about something that's going to cost us and if it gets done at all it's going to be a the other alternative is it's done separately or it's allied with something that's far more costly and then what what and then there's no hope for the you know it may and then everything falls together so it could be two three five years because it'll be a, maybe a couple of years before we we address that if that fails and then the cemetery issue is still there. And where, where we have gone. And there's going to be more costly. Without a doubt, it will be more costly in a couple of years. So I would say, for, for those people who have said, yes, it should be done, but, I would say, forget the but. Just leave it with it should be done, and let's do it now. Further discussion? Yes, in the back. We have a motion to uh, end debate. Is there a second? Second. This requires a two-thirds vote. Do I still have my counters? I do. Uh, I think we can trust you. <laughs> uh, all those in favor of stopping debate, please rise. Twenty-seven. Eighteen. Eighteen. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Twenty-four. And twenty-four. Those opposed to ending debate? Five. Five. Two. Two. Three. Three. Eleven. Eleven. The vote being 94 in the affirmative, 21 in the negative. The question has been moved. Debate has ended. Now, quick um, explanation before we take a final vote here. We first have a motion to refer it to the building committee. We'll vote on this first. If it, if it should carry, that will end 
uh, discussion on this issue for this town meeting. If that should fail, we would then take a vote on the main motion. So, excuse me, you still can't hear? All right, I will try. To <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion to refer it to committee, to the uh, building committee. If that motion should carry, then that would end all discussion about of this issue at this town meeting, and it would go to the new building committee. If that motion fails, we would then proceed to a vote on the main motion as presented. You understand that? Any questions? Do you have a point of order? Yes. Yes, because it does, even though it hasn't been appointed, it does exist as a, a town body. Everybody all set with that? We have another question in the back? Yes. It isn't, it, it's, it's not so much out of the scope in that it isn't required. So in this case, we could, this body could d decide to refer to that committee. Okay, so we're taking a vote on referring it to the building committee. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. Now we will vote on the main motion. Uh, all those in favor of this motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the chair is in doubt. It's a two-thirds vote. I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. Okay, not the, not the referring, but the main motion is a two-thirds vote. So we, we will take a... a um, a standing count. No, the amendment was accepted by the body already. Okay, all those in favor of this main motion, please rise. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Eighteen. Ten. Ten. 15. 15? 13. 13. And those opposed to the motion? Eighteen. 14. 14? 20? 5. 5. The vote being six, 56 in the affirmative, 57 in the negative, the motion does not carry. Um, Dr. Ensminger, we have a motion to adjourn until Monday evening. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, this town meeting stands adjourned until Monday.